good evening guys and welcome out to Textus Receptus. Um, actually, welcome out to Revolution and we are looking at the Textus Receptus. Now, it's after midnight here. It's um, 20 past 12. I've been up since 6 o'clock in the morning. I've just gone to Brisbane <clears throat> and back, which was probably about five hours, five and a half hours in a car. Um, but that's what we do. And um, so this morning I watched a video by Dwayne Green, and this was about an article by Timothy Decker. So Timothy Decker did an article on the evangelical textual criticism um, dot blogspot.com website. And this, he um, talks about the Texas Receptus. And so he says he looked at 22 editions of the TR and he said um, that there were some major issues with this. And so um, I listened to this uh, twice and um, there were some technical things in this. And so I thought, well, I really need to just go through what he's written, examine the claims that he's examining and um, also just um, examine what the Trinitarian Bible Society have said and also what Elijah Hickson is saying about um, confessional bibliology. And we're going to watch the video uh, by Dwayne Green. So obviously uh, being late at night and me just jumping on at a bit of a whim, um, basically I've come home, I'm wide awake, I, can't, I probably can't sleep for the next few hours. So I thought, well, I may as well do a video. Um, <clears throat> I think this might actually stretch out to a few videos, even though this is only, I think it's only a 20 minute video as far as I remember. And um, I'll just get it up here. So yeah, it's only, yeah, 25 minutes. And so, but this could go on for quite a few editions because um, it is in depth and I do want to look also at the article that he has written and so and hopefully what i'll be able to do is guide you through exactly what his claims are about the trinitarian bible society about the texas receptus about texas receptus advocates and also about differences um apparent um differences in texas receptus additions okay so just from the get-go this is a spoiler um basically the trinitarian bible society have done a very very good job at defending the king james the texas receptus do i adhere to absolutely everything they say no um at the end of the day i i might read through some of their articles that i have a whole bunch of articles on their website let me just show you that so um codex sinaiticus the divine original the greek new testament they have lots and lots of um, articles about you know, English uh, translations, New King James, a critique, etc. What private interpretation is. Now, some of these articles are very old. Some of them are quite recent. But the Trinitarian Bible Society, um, they have gone through ups and downs since their formation. Now, just to give you a quick rundown, if you don't know about the Trinitarian Bible Society, in 1804, the Bible Society was formulated by a group of people, one of them being William Wilberforce. And they created the Bible Society. They were to use the Texas Receptus, the Masoretic Text, and also use the King James Version as a guide for foreign language translation. So this was the British Bible Society, and it later on became the British and Foreign Bible Society. And today that is sort of under the whole umbrella of the United Bible Societies or the UBS. And so what happened was in 1804 when they started, now there was certain a, a certain amount of compromise where they did have a, a Catholic work on some of the Bible translations and things like that. But eventually what happened was uh, by the time it came to 1831, so you're just looking at, you know, uh, you know 20, what's that, 26, 27 years later, uh, after its formation, they have come to the stage where there were so many Unitarians in the Bible Society 
that they had to formulate the Trinitarian Bible Society. So a lot of the Trinitarians left the Bible Society at that stage and formulated the Trinitarian Bible Society. Now, this all came to a head one time when there was a conference and some of the some of the members were praying in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Some of them said that Jesus is God and Jehovah and things like that. So these people were booed, and th there was just a lot of um, a lot of animosity from the Unitarians who had basically infiltrated the movement. So once they started formulated the Trinitarian Bible Society, the, their main thrust was to be anti unitarian okay and to support bibles that had the trinity because these these unitarians wanted you know one john 5 7 deleted they wanted you know instead of god was manifest in the flesh they wanted he appeared in the body pretty much what you see in modern versions today that's what they wanted that's why sometimes i'll even refer to the west cotton cortex as a unitarian bible that trinitarians today are trying to defend now the trinitarian bible society came on the scene now, they've done quite a lot of work. Now, they are an old institution, started in um, 1831. So they've had quite a lot of different um, leadership styles. So there was a guy called Bullinger. Now, you might know Bullinger from a book that he brought out about um, Bible numerics. And so he'd talk about what the number one means, number two, number three, number four, and he goes through um, different numbers in the Bible. And it's, it's quite a fascinating read. But he also critiqued the Texas Receptus and the King James to the point where he was offering critiques, a bit like Scrivener. You know, he's sort of a cloaked in um, a guise of being a friend of the King James and the TR, but he's offering all these alternate readings and, and strange things that we look at today and go, why, why would you be gravitating towards these type of readings? But this was just the compromise that was happening in the churches in those days. And so what we've seen, um, even in the 1980s and 1990s, there was uh, some compromise in the Trinitarian Bible Society with one of their leaders. I'm pretty sure his name was Brown. Um, and I'm, I think he is um, instrumental in uh, translating Erasmus's annotations into English uh, for the book of Revelation and 1 John. I'm pretty sure. Anyway. So he um, was accused of basically supporting the majority text because there was a lot of overlap in certain groups and a lot of confusion about what the Texas Receptus was because it used to be, the Texas Receptus used to be called the majority text. That's what a name of it was. Now they printed an edition called the majority text in the 1980s. So this caused a lot of confusion People were like, well, how can the King James be based on the majority text if there's differences? And, you know, it just created a whole bunch of confusion, which was completely unnecessary. And some people were um, who were TR advocates were supportive of the, the majority text. Even the Dean Bergon Society. Dean Bergon basically started the modern day majority text movement. So the Dean Bergon Society was basically a Texas receptus movement um, that also promoted the King James. And these guys was calling their society the Dean Bergon Society, but Dean Bergon was the main player in the modern majority text uh, editions. So unfortunately, there's been this overlap. But even critical text people like Dan Wallace, James White have attacked both groups. They throw people like Zane Hodges into a King James only camp. Um, that's what um, one of the categories that James White calls King James only is he actually said Zane Hodges, um, who was like a majority text guy, he's a King James only guest, you know. Um, and so even um, Dan Wallace said majority text people are modern day Marcionites. And so how much less does he think of Texas Receptus people, you know. And so, um, yeah, so the history of the Trinitarian Bible Society is when I read through their articles and when I read their conclusions and things like that, the vast majority of the time, it's fine. But there are some cases, like say they still believe in the old um, story that the LXX was used by Jesus, was used by the apostles. Uh, this, th this 
type of concept seems to have faded away um, in uh, TR, KJV circles. But in a group like the Trinitarian Bible Society, that they still think that. They, they would teach that, yes, Jesus probably is a Septuagint, where to me it's just never been... Uh, I remember listening to uh, D.A. Waite talk about that quite a long, long time ago on a, a radio program with Joseph Chambers. And he really cleared up a, a lot of issues about the LXX saying that he doesn't believe that it was written um, before Christ because that was one of the stumbling blocks in my mind. I was thinking, yeah, but if Jesus used the LXX, well, you know, how can we, uh, how can we critique modern Bibles for being different if he used a different Bible? And, and so I had to really clear that issue up in my mind. And so, but when I read through the Trinitarian Bible Society articles, they basically say, well, the, the um, LXX, the Septuagint, is a BC document. So for me, I, I believe that the, there could have been some parts of the Bible, um, a verse here, verse there, um, translated. I, I, if they find something, it wouldn't surprise me. But as far as a wholesale LXX, I think that came later. I, can, I think it came with the birth of the church in Greece and Asia Minor. And so the Greek speaking church, basically they um, would have wanted the Old Testament. So they would have worked on that. And so eventually it became um, the fifth column of Origins Hexapla was the LXX that became popular. And the vast majority of um, that information you would find in a, in a Trinitarian Bible Society article, but then they would conclude, no, there was a BC um, LXX that Jesus used and all this sort of stuff. And so um, I would disagree with them with that. Now, apparently in this article by Decker, they've found um, some other mistake in a Trinitarian Bible Society argument. Now, what I find is these guys... Um, when I say these guys, they do seem to be part of like a group because, um, you yeah, know, Mark Ward will jump on board and say, yay, well done, brother, this is great. And, and yeah, the guy who wrote a book about the preface to the um, preface of the King James, the translators to the reader, when you go through his book, it's it's not really well written. It's just sort of basically a, a, a promotion of the New King James. But at the end of the day, um, he's sort of lauded as being part of their group. And I guess anyone who sort of comes against the TR group, the King James groups, uh, they're seen as sort of like the frontline warriors, the the guys who, you, you know, the soldiers who you stand up um, when they, you know, enter the room sort of guys. You know, <laughs> these guys are on the front line against these cultists, the Ruckmanites and, you know, the, the, the culty type of people like myself. You know, I'm just a... A horrible uh, occultist you know and yeah, mark ward keeps saying i'm a ruckmanite and and we'll look at some of the comments that these people make elijah hickson will say you know we're just ruckmanites and and we're all dishonest apparently you know it's it's quite amazing when you read through what these guys actually think about us it's it's quite amazing you know mark ward screaming out there for, for charitable discourse but um when someone does that like say brian ross offers you know, a hand of fellowship, offers you know, charitable discourse, they throw him under the bus and call, call him a coward and slander him and then basically tell everyone everything's fine. You know, we're, we're still in good relationship with this guy. And he made five videos, I think it was, basically explaining how they've slandered him, <laughs> They've wh why are they doing this? They're being uncharitable themselves. They're lying about him. And so, but anyway, I'm digressing. Why don't we have a look at this article? So I'm hoping that I can go through this article and then start the uh, Dwayne Green video, but this might sort of go off in a few different directions. Now, I don't want to get too involved in all the technical details because it is getting very late here at night. And so I don't want to be one of those guys just sort of, you know, opening the Bible and trying to, you know, read, um, you know, boring amounts of information. I just sort of want to touch on a few things and then when uh, the time comes, we'll go through some of these technical issues because I've done quite a lot of collation between TR editions myself. 
Now, one thing that amazes me, <laughs> Mark Ward seems to think that if you tell people there's differences between Textus Receptus additions, which they have labeled, you know, addition, these are Textus Receptus additions, you know, if there's differences between them, it's a shock, it's, it's horrible, it's like this is the Achilles heel to the Textus Receptus position. I'll just show you my website. <laughs> it just It's sort of humorous to, to look at it this way. So my website is Texas Receptus. Okay. Now, I've been working on this website since 2008. Now, if we were just to pick, um, say, Matthew 1. Let's just go to Matthew 1 as an example. Matthew 1, 1. Now, I know, like, Stephen Boyce actually said that uh, when he was with James White talking about the Texas Receptus that, he used to carry around the blue bound TR and he thought that was it. That's the TR. But then he found out that there was more than one TR and it sort of shook his whole world sort of thing. And I'm thinking, <laughs> and so anyway, I would pull up, oftentimes I'll pull up that TR and just point out that there's only two pages in English in the one the Trinitarian Bible Society sell. And in the preface, they mention other editions of the TR so frequently, I can't remember how many there was. It was something like 30 editions of the TR that they mentioned <laughs> on the only two pages that are in English. So imagine walking around with this, like, hey, you know, we've got our TR, we've got our TR. Are you actually reading the thing? <laughs> are you studying it? Like, if you had opened it up and gone through um, just the first two pages, the only two pages in English, I'm sure after a while you're trying to read the Greek and you're getting a bit bored and you're like, oh, I'll read the preface, you know, at least I'm reading something. And it talks about, you know, um, the five editions of Erasmus. It talks about, um, it even talks about, you know, Plantin, talks about the Complutensian. It talks about Colonnaeus. It talks about the five, uh, four editions of Stephanus, the five editions of Beza. And then it goes on to the Elzevers. <laughs> it goes right through the list of TRs. So the, the first thing that sort of amazes me, it doesn't amaze me because people are just trying to bring up new shock scarecrow things about the Texas Receptus all the time. And so oftentimes I, I hear these things and I'm like, well, what are you talking about? So when, you know, Stephen Boyce is like, oh, you know, I was shocked that there was more than one edition of the TR. It's like, okay, so let's look at my website here. <laughs> um, I'm a Texas Receptus person. They ignore me because I don't fall into the Sam Gip type of thing or the, the Gail Ripplinger type of thing or, you know, they would really wish that I was like that because then they could, you know, just throw me under the bus too. Now, this this is this is my information on Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, okay? Now, I have, even just in my interlinear here, I've got the 1611, 1900, the KJV 2023, which I worked on, which is up updated English, but I'm still called a Ruckmanite by these people. Uh, and you're starting to understand that they just hate the Texas Receptus. Um, so I've got a commentary. I talk about Vivlos, the book. Um, then I have you know, annotations of Theodore Beza. So am I afraid of looking at the annotations? No. Am I afraid of looking at, you know, Greek words. No, am I afraid of looking at the LXX, the Septuagint? No, I'm underlining things, I'm boldening things, I'm showing where other versions have different readings. Um, I'm showing my concerns, um, you know, looking at Manetti's um, Latin, which was 70 years before Beza, which was based primarily on Greek manuscripts. So it's a good representative of earlier Greek manuscripts 70 years before um, sorry, before Erasmus, I should say, not Pisa. Um, people like Adam Clark, Solomon Caesar Malone, who wrote a book uh, called A Plea for the Received Text and of the Authorised Version. So he talks a lot about these issues. Philip Schaff, who was a liberal, who was working for um, you know, basically Ellicott and, the, and the, the Revision Committee, Dean Bergon, he had a lot to say about these issues. Um, we look at the revised version. I've got some nice, pretty little pictures there that everyone can look at, what the Jehovah's Witnesses say about it. And so I think you get the drift. You know, when you go down, 
there's a lot of information here. Now, I've compared the Complutensian polyglot. I've got a nice picture of it here. I even put those words in red so that people can just follow them. The Aldean edition, Cephalus, the five editions of Erasmus, um, Colonnaeus, I haven't put that one in yet. I'm not sure why. Cessa uh, in 1538, the four editions of Stephanus are there. The five major editions of Theodore Beza are there. So his first one was Latin. His um, last four were in Greek, and he had a whole bunch of uh, other editions. And look, you can click and go straight to the Erara site and look at them yourself. So I'll try and open, say, this one. Uh, hopefully it doesn't chew up all my bandwidth. But yeah, there we go. We can look straight away at the Vivlos Genesius. Jesus Christ, we are David, we are Abraham. You can look straight at the Greek, you can look straight at the Latin, and so this is the Greek um, of Beza, the Latin of Beza, and then this is the Syriac of Tremelius and the Latin um, of uh, Tremelius, and I think Beza also worked on this as well. So you can look at that straight away from my website, so you can go through and see these different editions of the Texas Receptus. The plant and polyglot, Elias Hutter, the Elzevers edition. So usually it's only the two that are important, the 24 and 33 edition. The London polyglot, so I've got that there. Uh, John Mill's edition, you can see what John Mill has there. With all his footnotes, I've even put those there as well. Scholl's um, 1841 edition. Scribner's 1881, which is basically just Beezer's rehashed. Um, then I'm looking at other Greek. So we've got um, Papyrus 1, Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus. Um, then we've got uh, Codex Washingtonianus, um, Codex Basiliensis. So I've got a whole bunch of manuscripts going down, Minuscule 44, 57, 504, 1152, and then down to printed, Bengel, Wettstein, um, going through all this edition, Alfred, uh, Tischendorf, down to um, Westcott and Hort, Nestle, Greek Orthodox, Weiss von Sodden, and then Anglo-Saxon, and then, and then a whole bunch of English translations as well. And I've got like pretty pictures. There's Papyrus 1 there in 250 AD. Um, there's a few missing, but I'm, you know, I'll fill them in one day. So I've got lots and lots and lots and lots of information. So when people are saying, oh, these TR people are afraid of variants there, you know, they don't know that there's more than one edition of a TR. Who are they talking about? Lots and lots of people use this website, okay? Now, if I go to the special pages here, open new tab, it gives me statistics. So I can go um, statistics here. So 87 million page views on my website. That's a lot. <laughs> so the most viewed pages are the main page, 14 million. Texas Receptors Community Portal, 191,000. It just goes through 1057, et cetera. So, but 87 million. So, you know, we're 13 million shy of, of 100 million views. And that, that's just, yeah, that's all the pages. And there's a lot of pages in the database. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of people looking at my site. Lots of people comment on my site. They say, oh, there's an error here or this page isn't working. And there's so much information. Sometimes pages can be dormant for, for a long, long time. Okay, But it just seems like these people who are attacking the TR, they ignore this site. It's like it doesn't exist. I mean, who, who else has got this type of information about the Texas Receptus just in one place? I've got commentaries. I mean, if you wanted to know what Alfred said in his Greek commentary, you just go to my website and I've, I've already got this all written down. It's, and so, yes, there are some pages that have hardly anything on it, but there are some pages like, you know, usually pages that are disputed, Revelation 16.5, 1 John 5.7, you know, these type of things that people are actually talking about. I've got information on there that can help people, that can guide people, so people don't have to do all the homework, and also so they don't have to look these things up like I did. I've taken a snap, 
You can look at the polyglot here, the Syriac. You can look at the Latin translation of the Syriac. Um, it's all there for you to do your homework. And so when it comes to this first claim that, you know, oh, it's a shock horror that there's different TRs. I mean, I, I just, who's, who's saying that? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, I just, I mean, you would have to be almost illiterate to think that, TR people don't know that. Okay. What I you know, I would never I've never claimed that. I, I don't know anyone who would ever claim that. The TBS has like 30 editions mentioned in the front of their TR edition. And <laughs> it's just so silly. And so in this, I'm showing clearly even just capitalized letters and things like that, different spellings, you know, Dawid or David or or David Dawid. Um and so you can go through and you can check all of these. A lot of the time I've typed it out personally myself. Okay. So I would love for every verse on this site to be like this and to have this much detailed information. It takes a long time, but I've gone through it and I've done it where I can possibly do it. You know, if, if um, people online start talking about yeah, Ephesians 3.9, for example. Let's have a look at that. Ephesians 3.9. So when that came up, I think it was James White was saying there's no evidence whatsoever for that. And then um, we ended up finding yeah, manuscript evidence for it. <laughs> um, and so fellowship or administration, koinonia or oikonomia. And so... You can see where um, Theodore Beza had a, a Greek concordance. Uh, and so we're looking at uh, Koinonia, where this word appears in the Texas Receptus, which is basically the you know, King James. And so where fellowship appears um, in different versions. Um, but then we're looking at you know, Tertullian, uh, he's in his Latin. We're looking at a whole bunch of things. P46, where this was claimed to have the reading of um, koinonia, but actually has, uh, oh, sorry, oikonomia, but actually has koinomia, konomia. And sometimes the new can look like this. And if you study manuscripts, you know that. But it basically, it says this, um, the TR says that, and the critical text says that. And so uh, it's sort of not on favor with either, but I, I would say it's very close to Quinonia. Um, very interesting. Um, but it doesn't have the um, Yota there. Check Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, Alexandrinus. So I go through and show lots of pictures on this. So I'm showing like lots and lots of manuscript evidence, okay? And so places where Oikonomia yeah, appears or or um, Koinonia appears. But at the end of the day, if you go down to just the printed editions, um, which start here, I've got the Complutensian Polyglot. I've, I haven't got the Aldine yet, Cephalus, but I've got Erasmus. I've got all his five editions, okay? So you can just go through and check that yourself. The Colonnaeus, the Stephanus, I've got uh, his last two editions which are the most important. Now, I can easily put those in, but it just takes time. Beza, I've got mostly his last two editions. Um, so who is saying, like, firstly, I just want to debunk that whole thing that people go, oh, Texas Receptus editions, you know, they have differences in them and all this sort of stuff. It's, it's just so, so silly to me because I, I'm studying these. I, I, I don't think I've ever had anyone ever so there's no differences between the Texas Receptuses. And these are just, it's a name retroactively given to a whole bunch of Greek texts. Now, the critical text didn't exist in the Reformation period. It's just gone. You know, it wasn't invented yet. It wasn't wasn't made yet. So they they just go, well, these are all TR edition, printed editions, but it's TR editions. So that's all there was. So doesn't that speak volumes for itself? But just like English versions, 
I, like if you said, well, we got Tyndale, Coverdale, Geneva, Great Bible, Bishop's Bible, would you say that they're all the same? You would say, well, they're, they're very similar, but there are differences. And that's what we say about TR editions. And if someone came along and said, hey, do you realize that there were Bibles before the King James and they have differences? You would just go, yeah. And what, what are you trying to get at here? So that means that people who say the Reformation Bibles are, are like the King James are the best, they're, they're deceived, they're liars, or they're, you're just sort of left there going, um, why are you creating this straw man argument? Clearly, <laughs> In the beginning of this, it talks about all those, all the editions of the Texas receptors. Clearly, if you do any type of study, you can see the differences between TRs. And I don't know anyone who's saying, I don't know anyone who's saying that there's just, there's only one like TR. Now, people might say they prefer one edition. They might say, well, this is it. Or they might um, say, um, your visas uh, 1598 that's it or they might say well the underlying text of the King James that's it it hasn't been printed properly yet this is pretty good but it's just just a few sprinkles of Scrivener that we don't like but at the end of the day I, I don't know anyone who's just saying there's no differences between any any of these now so that's the that's the type of thing that you know Stephen Boyce was saying. Okay, and um yeah, James White makes much ado about this. It's like there's differences in TR editions, and Mark Ward sort of jumped on that bandwagon as well. And then um now he's trying to show differences between Scrivener's edition and the 1550. Now, Doug Wilson, he seems to hold up 1550 and say that's it. And most People, even James White was like, oh, I've never really heard that before. I've heard people say underlying text of the King James, perhaps Beza's 1598, it's the closest, or, you know, Scrivener's, you know, 250 years after the King James translated, he did his edition, that's probably the closest or whatever. But he said, um, I don't know really anyone who's just saying the 1550, but Doug Wilson does. But most people are not. Most TR people are saying that it's, you know, either... The underlying, un, unprinted, still unprinted, the underlying text of the King James Bible, or it's Beza's 1598, or it's Scrivener's. Most people are saying those things. So why did, why does Mark Ward compare Scrivener to Stephanus? He goes right back to Stephanus. And it's like, well, why are you doing that? Why are you comparing... It's like me comparing the NA28 with... Um, Luckman's text. People are like Luckman, who what's that? Well, that was the first ever you know, critical text printed, first ever non TR text printed. But you go, well, I, I don't support that, you know. Exactly. <laughs> well, why would I do that? Why would I compare those and say, see, look at the differences? You know, it's like it, it's it's just an argument that no one's no one's supporting the 1550. People see these Texas Receptus editions as a progression, just like we see with the English Bibles. We see the King James as the pinnacle of English Bibles. Now, if I I can go back to the Geneva Bible and say, yeah, it's good. But I wouldn't want, say, the reading of Matthew 1.11 to have Jacob in the um, genealogy there, as the Geneva also does. It's an extra person in the genealogy. So which is better, the King James? or the bishops in Geneva, which have an extra person in the genealogy. None of the modern Bibles put that in either. So when you're saying which English editions, I could say, look, they're all good. But and just like the King James translator said, we wanted to make out of many good ones, one principal good one. So in other words, if they were perfect before 1611, they wouldn't have done their project, but they did it because they saw imperfections in the text. And I can just look at the Geneva and, and point out, hey, there's an imperfection there. Easily. I can point out dozens and dozens of places in the Bishop's Bible, Geneva Bible, in the earlier English editions. I can't do that with the King James. When someone puts the King James in front of me, I can't find error. 
And uh, I challenge anyone, I will debate anyone in the world on this. You bring forth your variance, your King James era reading, blah, blah, blah. I'll debate you. I'll, you can come on my channel. We can have a discussion about it. Or we can have a formal debate about this. That's how confident I am. I've debated this for many years. Um, you know, people say, oh, Easter's a pagan festival and all this sort of rubbish. And uh, Easter shouldn't be in the Bible. Or Revelation 16.5, you know, that's a uh, conjectural emendation. And, you know, I've proven all those things to be completely wrong. And a lot of people have actually left the TRKJV movement over these type of issues. Um, I'll debate anyone, anywhere, anytime. And so the issue is people are saying, okay, there's, you know, there's differences between TR editions. And say Mark Ward sort of pits these TRs against each other. It's like me getting um, the Coverdale Bible and the Geneva Bible and saying, look, look at these differences here. There's differences while I'm trying to discredit the King James sort of thing. It's like, um, no, who's looking at all these older editions of the Texas Receptors? Out of curiosity, we might do a study and go, oh, yeah, well, that was introduced in the 1527 of Erasmus uh, through the Complutensian Polyglot, and it's based upon these manuscripts. We might look at that type of genealogical method of, you know, where did it come from? And sometimes you, you just can't tell, you know, there's just a manuscript that someone had that's no longer available or whatever. But at the end of the day, no one's going back and saying, yes, let's let's print uh, Erasmus's first edition and use that, or the Complutensian, or really even the 1550. Most people, like, I remember when I first was looking into the TR issues and all the rest of it, I, I was like, oh, the 1550, it's like, oh, no, that's not what the, the King James guys used something better. You know, it was a, it was a text of Beza, so that's what I wanted, the text of Beza. But then um, more studies showed me the text of Beza that the King James had its own Texas Receptus edition, but they never printed it. They never printed a parallel Greek Bible. So had they done that, there would be no TR movement. There would be no King James movement. They'd just be all one. Because most people just go with the choices of the King James translators anyway, if you're looking at Scrivener. Now, people to say that this is just a back translation of the English that's just complete rubbish. This is Beza's text. Beza cooked this up. He did all the hard work. He went out and killed the animal, brought it in, skinned it, cooked it, and he, he served it right up. And Scribner just comes along 250 years later with, um, with the Beza text and just has a little sprinkling of... Uh, probably about 20 King James readings there, and he added about 170 um, big chunks of pepper on there that don't really need to be there. They actually take away from the flavour. But it's And he's serving that up going, this is my text. And it's like, uh, no, it's actually Beezer's text. Now, he didn't necessarily do that deceptively, but that this is what is usually brought across. You know, I've, you know, he worked on this text. Now, King James TR people have been guilty of thinking this as well that he was like a tr guy he was a westcott and hort guy through and through he despised many of the readings in the king james and the texas receptors and so did Jean, dean john william burgon a lot of these guys of that era they um like say burgon had enough bullets to come against westcott and hort but he was a majority text guy he supported the traditional text not the texas receptors just because scrivener worked on this doesn't mean he's a tr guy if you just read his other books, he's saying one John five seven in the bin. He says he says like forty three verses or something. Just delete from the King James. It's like he's. I think he was one of the main driving forces behind the Westcott and Hort text. Now he mightn't have wanted the pick up adultery out of the last twelve verses of Mark, but it's it's sort of like, you know, oh they're going to cut off all your fingers, and he's like, oh don't cut off your thumbs, and it's like oh, okay, we'll leave the thumbs then, you know but he's still cutting off all your fingers that many of these guys were deeply compromised. And so um, we've got to point that out because what's happening is these guys, Mark Ward and these other guys are um, coming up to speed with some of this information. And some of the TR guys don't 
haven't caught up with this or they're you know it's one of those issues where if you don't focus on it you can sort of you know not see the forest through the trees and you think oh dean bergon's on our side or scribner's a tr guy and you end up making these claims and you know these guys love that because then they attack you on that and so apparently the trinitarian bible society have made claims that um there wasn't much difference between the TR editions. Okay. Now I would say there's a lot of difference between the TR editions. One John five, seven, <laughs> just look at the first two editions of Erasmus. Now, if you were to give me a Bible, if it's a hundred percent King James Bible, but it didn't have one John five, seven in it. And then you give me a Bible with the same Bible with one John five, seven in it, you know, which one I'm going to choose. The one with the comia hanium in it because I, I believe it's genuine and so i've got many reasons for that but um i'm gonna follow that one okay so that to me it's a huge issue just to take the comia hanium out is a huge issue so obviously i don't accept the readings in um erasmus's first two editions at 1 john chapter 5 verse 7. And I don't think anyone does, <laughs> like who's a, a true TR, KJV person. So we know, like if I, if I was to ask any uh, TR, KJV person, do you follow the first edition of Erasmus? I'd say, oh, no, he takes the comma out. No, I don't follow that one. Do you follow the second edition? No. Do you follow the third? Oh, that's better. You know what I mean? Like, like And these guys are coming along saying, apparently there's really significant differences between tr editions like as if it's a big revelation we're sort of like oh, okay like and then they're talking about one word here and another word that just go to the comi johannium <laughs> the first two editions of erasmus didn't have it and then he put it in for very good reason because he understood that there's a, a solecism in the text and so if you have the critical text, it has a solecism, which is a Greek grammatical blunder. So in 1 John 5, 8, you have mismatched genders there. You have genders changed, which should only be changed if 1 John 5, 7 is in there. If it's taken out, you have them changed for no apparent reason. But if you put the comiohanium in, there is no solecism. So magically, this gloss from Latin which just, you know, apparently it was a marginal note that grew and then it entered into the text from a different language, fixes the Greek language. <laughs> it's, it's just amazing, these stories. But if you ask any um, true Greek grammarian about that, they'll say, yeah, you have to have the comiohanium in there. So this is strong internal evidence. Um, Eugenius Volgaris said this in 1780. Um, I talked to Georgios Babaniotis about this in... Um, uh, I think it was two years ago I talked to him, and he is probably the world-leading expert on the Greek language. He's written six Greek dictionaries, and he's also written 200 articles and books on the Greek language. And so uh, brilliant um, Greek linguist, speaks fluent Greek, um, and I asked him, was Eugenius Volgaris right to say that there is a solecism there? And he says, absolutely, you need 1 John 5, 7 in there to justify the changes that are in 1 John 5 8. If you know the Greek language, you will see there's a syntactic parallelism that occurs there. And um, that's an important thing for anyone to think about when looking at internal evidence in support of 1 John 5 7. But back to our story. So these guys are saying that there, you know, there's huge changes. Well, like we don't know that. Um, but apparently the Trinitarian Bible Society said something, and this affects us all. Now, if I was to go through Trinitarian Bible Society material and point out all the things that I would be in disagreement with them with, I'd be there for ages. Same with the Dean Bergon Society. Same with, you know, so where we data mine, we go through and go, okay, well, that's true. Well, that's not true. And I'm sure these critical text guys wouldn't always agree with James White, would they? or Dan Wallace, or like if I was to hold them all accountable for everything James White's ever written or said, or 
you would be you would be thinking that's unfair, you know. And so I'm sure that you know these guys liked to be judged according to what they think and what they teach. And so I, you know, these guys oftentimes will find something somewhere, you know, um, some KJV author, they'll find Gip or Ricklinger or whatever, and they'll say, well, all TR people, you know, need to repent or, you know, the whole Westcott and Hort thing. If you if you um, thought that Westcott and Hort, you know, uh, were vampires and drank blood, well, you need to repent. But, you know, <laughs> all the, they had this strange type of concept about Westcott and Hort that, you know, if you think they're a cultist, they need to repent. And, and then they're talking about how they were, you know, they proved that one of them went to a seance. And it wasn't long after that that he called the Texas receptors vile and villainous. And then they had Unitarians working on the text. It, it just got worse and worse. It got to the point where I was like, actually, the stuff that James White was saying, you know, we're Scott and Horde, it's, it's all untrue and all the rest of it. I'm like, these guys are proving half of that true. <laughs> like, I understand they're not vampires who are out, you know, sucking blood or whatever, but it's like they were sort of halfway there. They were... They were theologically liberal in a lot of things, heretical, according to me, um, in in certain things. And, like, I was just shocked when I went through um, that series. I was just like, well, these guys have Unitarians working on the text. Why are they compromising like this? Why are they making everyone sit down with these Unitarians? Why are they having communion with Unitarians? They're like Jehovah's Witnesses. And why are they allowing this Unitarian to write a book talking about the doctrinal changes that occurred in the re the revised version and the text underlying the revised version? Anyway, see my um, Textual Confidence Collective videos that I've recently did. So we've got a few comments here. Brian Ross is saying, hello all. Uh, he says, because he's trying to maximize the number of differences in TR editions. Yes, so we can point out that there's a lot of issues with the critical text and say okay it's got 2900 less words it's got 8000 changes okay so mark ward always tries to diminish everything it's like we're pointing out where there's you know issues your know, last 12 verses of my pricope adultery commia and one john um five uh, sorry one, uh, one timothy three sixteen. god was manifest in the flesh has changed it who appeared in the body and and so yeah this type of thing, um, Mark Ward just sort of wants to diminish it down to, to statistics and say, oh, that's only like one or two percent or all this sort of stuff. Uh, but when you look at these individually and you weigh them, you go, hang on, this causes great um, doctrinal significance. You wouldn't want someone who's saying, hey, the the in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You wouldn't want them... Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses to, to say the word was a God, then to turn around and say, oh, it's only like, you know, a certain percentage of, of John chapter one or the whole entire book of John. It's only what it's not even one percent. You know, you would say, yeah, but that a God changes a lot. So we all know that one little change like that can modify everything. And Jesus was often talking about the tiniest little parts of the Hebrew language to explain to the scribes and Pharisees and the Sadducees about different aspects of, you know, the Lord said unto my Lord, this, this type of thing. He's oftentimes using um, Greek grammar and the tiniest little um, nuances, sorry, I, I should, should have said Hebrew grammar, of the tiniest little nuances of, of Hebrew to bring across a, a theological point. And so this is important. You can't just go statistically, you know, the Bibles are different, you know, da, da, da. It's like, we want to know all the details, you know. But um, Mark Ward's dumbing it down. His website, KJV Parallel Bible, you know, he's like, oh, you know, there's hardly any difference, you know. Um, and I've just proven, yeah, the other day I jumped on there, um, um, Revelation chapter one, verse eight, where it says the beginning and the ending in the critical text, he doesn't have that there. So he doesn't have all the all the critical text readings there. And so it's just not thorough enough for him to turn around and say there's not there's hardly any readings. When he was making that website, Matthew chapter one, I challenged him on Facebook and I well, he was asking for help. And I said, Look, in Matthew chapter one, 
I showed him where there was four, four variants that he missed. Now, he added three of those variants to his text. So that's a lot. If I was to go through all 260 um, chapters, if there's just three in the first chapter, surely there's going to be probably three in the next and three in the next. You know, if I added all that up, that's, that's a lot of changes. So I don't think his addition is his KJV Parallel Bible is thorough enough. Because I'm fine, I, I find things on there that aren't even mentioned. I'm like, well, why isn't he mentioning that? That's significant. So Terry O'Neill says, I recently discovered revolution. I told my pastor about Nick Sayers that Scrivener was not a particularly a friend of the TR movement, but he painted Scrivener as a TR defender. So uh, this is quite a popular thing. And even critical text guys often say this. So it, I think it's just been like a, you know, it, it's just one of those things in history where people just think something and it's just it's just not a fact. And so um, uh, Terry said, I would be interested in learning more about Scrivener. And so basically Scrivener, he, he uh, studied the King James, studied the Texas Receptus editions. And so when it come to... Uh, like Westcott and Hort and, and um, Ellicott uh, or Ellicott was, you know, basically running the, the translation, um, the English translation, but Westcott and Hort, um, they basically commissioned Scrivener to do a TR edition that was the exact underlying text of the King James because um, you sort of got to Beza and it's very, very close to 1598. But then when the King James translators looked at Beza, there were a few things in his annotations where they went with those readings, about 20 places, so it's hardly any, but enough to call the King James' own TR edition. So it's a bit like, you know, it's 99 point, no, 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 you know, no, I was talking about statistics, but it's like you, you can sort of, you can look at the differences between Beza's, um, Beza's text and Scrivener's text in the appendix of Scrivener in his 1881 edition, 190 differences. Now, if you want a web page with that, if you just go to Google and type in 190 and Beza, oops, Beza, it'll take you to this texasreceptus.com page, which is my website. Now, I'm going through and looking at all these and I'm, I'm examining them and looking at all the claims of Scrivener looking at the differences, and I would say only 10% of these are translatable. So that's why I come up to the, the 20 differences mark. And so um, you can say tell like the, the ice here. Um, I've got Scrivener's annotations, he's Texas Receptus edition, but then I've got Beezer's which is his 1598, and then the King James, and then the annotations. And so I talk about this issue here. Um, and so the greens interlinear, a few other things. So I would encourage people to go to that. I might chuck this into, or if you just Google 190 and Beza, it should come up. Now, if it does come up with some of these photos like th this, this is only a recent phenomenon on my website where some of the pictures I uploaded under HTTP instead of HTTPS, which is a secure thing. And so they've, there's some new thing on the server where it doesn't really show unsecured photos. And so I've really got to sort this out. But um, because it's it does make an ugly page when you do have photos that don't show. But a lot of these photos do show. So say one example of the 190 is the difference between this smooth breathing here or a rough breathing. Hosios or Ozios. It's hardly any difference. So it's completely untranslatable. Um, so uh, many of these, uh, you know, translate to exactly the same thing. So... Um, so Terry says, what makes you think he wasn't a great TR defender? Well, see, Scrivener actually worked with Westcott and Hort on the Westcott and Hort text. So the Westcott and Hort text has thousands of 
Greek words missing for the TR and um, you know, almost 8,000 changes. Um, and so there's a lot of differences between um, the Westcott Hortex and the Texas Receptus. And in his book, The Plain Introduction to um, Textual Criticism, he clearly outlines verses that he wants deleted from the TR and, and from the King James. So he doesn't want 1 John 5, 7. And most of the verses that are deleted, like in Westcott and Hall or in modern Bibles, he's saying, yeah, delete them. So it doesn't matter if he made a TR edition. Um, I mean, you know, anyone can make a TR edition. It, it doesn't mean you believe it. And so, um, you know, someone can go and print Mein Kampf. You know, it doesn't mean that they're a Nazi, that they might have just been told to print that, you know. And so Scribner was just told to do the underlying text so that they could show the difference between this and Westcott and Hort. So he did an okay job, but most of this is Beza. There's a tiny sprinkling of Scrivener's ideas, about 20 translatable differences, and about 170 that are not really translatable at all. So um, the difference between Beza's and this is, is very, very minimal. Um, and sometimes I'm like, well, you shouldn't have done that. Scrivener, I'd go back with Beezer's reading. Um, so I'll show you one example. So say if we go to, um, uh, where are we? Matthew 10.10, 10, where it has Rabdos in Scrivener's, I should say 1881 actually, um, or in Beezer's, it has the singular Rabdon, okay? So what you'll find is Scrivener, has gone oh well the king james reads um nor yet staves staves just mean staffs plural staff you know they've looked at it lexically you'd go okay it's plural in english so it should be plural in the greek shouldn't it and they've gone and scrivener's gone that's what i'm going to put there but um what he's really not acknowledging is the context see so there's a uh lexical definition and there's a contextual definition the context he's talking to a group of people now if i said if i was standing in front of 50 people and i said um don't bring your phone tomorrow to don't bring your phone to work tomorrow am i talking to one person or to 50 i'm talking to 50 people so that singular phone becomes phones doesn't it so when you're saying don't um nor staves that's how it's translated in the King James. But in the Greek, it was rabdon, which is singular. But now the King James translators, they put it in the plural for their respective purposes because they didn't want it to look like a contradiction with other places in uh, Scripture where it's worded slightly differently and it's talking about, um, you know, do not bring a staff and it's talking, um, you can clearly see the context. And so it puts it in the plural here. So there's really no issue. It's just making a singular into a plural just to help the English Bible. So, but Scribner goes, oh, well, I think we should make it uh, so it's it's plural. Uh, rabdos or rabdon. So I think Beza's reading is perfectly fine. It's like saying phone, where Scribner's gone, well, I think it should say phones, uh, plural. Now, what are they going to both, if you translate in context, it will translate into staffs or staves. If you translate that word just lexically, it'll translate into staves. So it's completely untranslatable. It won't matter which reading it is, but this is the correct reading. Scrivener was like, okay, I want it to be plural because it matches the English plural, not really acknowledging the context. Um, but you can see in the earlier English versions, they did have it in the singular, but the King James put it in the plural because they wanted the English Bible to have um, a good apologetic when it came to um, consistency with the other um, the other things that were said about bringing a staff. And so um, that got changed. Do I think it's necessary? No. Um, and that's the type of changes that Scrivener was doing. And they're the type of differences. It doesn't really make that much of a difference at all.
and so um, that's just one example that I just thought I'd, I'd throw out there. So um, Terry says, uh, Scribner argued against where Scott and Hall is what my pastor told me. And that's quite a common misconception. Now, he might have sided with some of Bergon's conclusions about, say, the larger chunks of, uh, you know, the 12 verses of Mark or the Pricope Adulteri uh, and things like that. But when it came to 1 John 5, 7, he was like, throw it straight out. So this is where, um, I guess, without having a, a technical understanding of things, a lot of pastors just think that. Because a lot of people are busy. They don't have time to look up all this stuff. And, um, but I wouldn't say that, like I would say that people just have a cursory understanding of the Texas Receptus a lot of the time. They're just looking from the road and they look at the house and go, oh, yeah, that looks good. But they're not really closely examining these things. And so sometimes these cursory looks where it looks like Scribner's a TR guy, that can just become a, a, a story in itself. And so people, when I'm like, oh, I don't think he was a TR guy, people can get all upset um so he's on the record for wanting to remove verses i guess that's pretty plain that he wasn't a defender of the tr thanks yeah if you go to um plain introduction scrivener that should be yeah a plain introduction to the criticism of the new testament you can go to internet archive i might even be able to pull up a picture where he actually has some deleted verses um so maybe i should go to the front matter okay general character of the greek new testament divisions of the text appendix larger unctuals um <clears throat> yeah so it looks like it's at the back of the book as far as i can remember he's got a lot of interesting information here and some of it's true some of it's wrong now there is a place where basically he's just he's got a list of verses that he wants deleted so um maybe i can find that i'll just have a quick look and we're in no rush here you know we're here to look at these things examine these things and to think about them uh not to just rush through and like have a cursory look we, we want to look at the minutia uh look at these tiny little details because oftentimes it's, it's these details that can really uh change people's perspective on on something so yeah, I can't really find um, the English verses that, that he wants to get rid of. Um, but it's not stopping me from continually clicking. Okay, so anyway, I'm going to throw that a plain introduction if you type that into google with scrivener you should be able to get there okay so um let's go through this so this is by elijah hickson a guest post by Timothy Decker. So as far as I can tell, Timothy Decker seems like a majority text guy. I don't think he's a critical text guy. A critical apparatus of the Texas Receptus tradition. Okay. The following. So the reason I'm reading this is because this was done on March 13th. So we're, we're here in Australia. We're, we're in the, the 24th of March at the moment. So the video that uh, Dwayne Green did was just this morning. So I want to get some background info. So the following is a guest post by Timothy L. Decker. He received his PhD from Capital Seminary and Graduate School in 2021. 
He is a professor of Biblical Languages and New Testament at Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary and an adjunct professor of New Testament with International Reformed Baptist Seminary. He is also one of the pastors of Trinity Reformed Baptist Church near Rowenke, VA. Um, his most recent publication is a revolutionary reading of Romans 13. Uh, his edition of the Sermon of the Mount, which provides the data behind this post, is available here. So I looked at this earlier. So pretty much what he's done, he's... Um, just go to here he's basically gone through the sermon of the mount and he is um looking at 22 different tr editions okay so um sort of you know like what i did in matthew 1 when i showed that earlier you know i'll just quickly bring that up again <laughs> or ephesians 3 9 for example you know we, we've got the complutensian polyglot the aldean kephalos Erasmus, Colonnaeus, four editions of Stephanus, five editions of Beza, the Elzevers, Scribner, you know, a bunch of others. And so um, that's sort of the type of thing that he's doing. He's just going through and pointing out where there's differences between Matthew, I think, 5, 6, and 7. So we're looking at three chapters here. So if we go to the bottom of the page, um, so where he has a little bit of a, a mark, here um it you know, talks about erasmus uh word ended line which may explain the presence of the new uh erasmus's second third fourth and fifth aldean coffell gabellius so these are people who were with um erasmus um erasmus's first the aldean so he's talking about these differences in the greek um between uh, Greek editions, okay, which is fine. You know, that's the sort of thing that I do as well on my, my website, pointing out these issues, um, you know, finding finding where there's uh, issues with these. And so this is pretty much what he's done. And so he's pointing out, um, you know, the difference, differences between Erasmus and, and Compoly, uh, oh, yeah, Complutensian in Polyglot. So he's... He's put that as comp poly uh, colonnaeus there. Um, yeah, pretty much. Yes, yeah, a few other editions to Fanus. So he's saying there's 22 editions that he went with. Okay. Um, so say, for example, <clears throat> my uh, Matthew 1. So I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm pretty sure I've got about probably that number of t printed TR editions. Complutensian Polyglot one, Aldine two, Kefalos three, uh, Erasmus have five, so that brings it up to eight. Uh, Colonnaeus nine, Cessa ten, Stephanus had four, so that's fourteen. Visa had five, um, which would make nineteen. Um, then you've got Plantum Polyglot, which is pretty much the Complutensian Polyglot, um, but we'll, we'll call that, you know, uh, say 20, Hatta, 21, two editions of Elzer that are important, 22, and then London Polyglot was basically the 1550, so we can't count that, John Mill. So, yeah, about 22. That's interesting because that's the number that he come up with. So I've got about the same on my website, 22 editions. Now, he does go to some editions that I don't have here that were friends of Erasmus. Now, I'm not sure how many changes were there, um, but I do want to put absolutely everything into my website. So, but I just thought I'd show you that, yeah, what he's doing is pretty much what myself, I'm a TR person. I do this sort of work all the time. Uh, when I'm listening to other TR people, they're doing this type of work all the time. When I go to, um, you know, the kjvtoday.net site, that's what he's doing uh, many times, even people who would just say oh, i'm a king james only like say will kinney oftentimes he's doing this stuff he's he's showing where there's differences in trs and stuff like that so it's, it's nothing new this is this is yeah i've been doing this for like you know what 20 years now um okay <clears throat> 
a critical apparatus of the Texas receptors tradition. Claims from those who promote and advocate for the Texas receptors. In a brief article written by G.W. and D.E. Anderson and published on the Trinitarian Bible Society's website, they asked, are the variations between the additions of the Texas receptors significant? Uh, it says the answer, it should say they answered. No, these variations include spelling, accents, and breathing marks, word order, and other kinds of differences. Okay, so they've got a, a little one here. So it might be right down the bottom, unfortunately, because it's not pages. But let's see if we can just find the things. Here we go. Um, okay, so this is on the received text. So that's good because I've got this handily right here. Okay, so I will search for that exact. Um, uh, and it's also the next one, I think, is the AK and AD, the AK. Uh, the New Testament. Um, so I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I've got that one as well open. Yes, so I do. So I'm prepared. So we'll we'll look at those. Let's just go straight back up. Sorry about all this scrolling, but it's just the way the web page is set up. Um, it's no fault to anyone. So yeah. So apparently they've said. Um, yeah, are there differences between the additions of the Texas or are, are they significant differences? Okay, so um, let's look at that. Let's look at that claim. Um, if I just type in differ. Um, okay, so it says here, there were additions from the textual editors such as Erasmus, Stephanus Beza, Yells of his middle and Scrivener. These editions differ slightly from one another, but still are regarded as the same basic text. Okay, so we'll, uh, you know, they're even labeled the text of receptors by most of the critical text guys. Most people would label them as TR editions, but acknowledge that there's differences. So, yet what they're saying there is it's okay so far. Um, the critical text differs from the text of receptors, 5,000. 337 times according to one calculation blah 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 so they're looking at other things certain editions were popular in different countries yes that's true um the critical text is called differs widely from the traditional text that's very true um okay so i'm looking for the exact quotation okay so I'm going to, I want to find exactly what they're saying here. So the additions of Stevens. So I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just type in um, a word which probably won't appear anywhere else. Actually, okay, that doesn't appear at all. So maybe I'm in the wrong article. Let me get this. Greek New Testament. Oh, the received text. I think that was the one. Let's look at that one. Found it straight away. Here we go. Drum roll. I, I don't. I haven't checked all this, so I don't. I don't know. This is just live, looking at this to see if there's any, you know, um, if they're misrepresenting these guys. If they're representing them, that's fine. I, I don't agree with everything with the T R. Uh, sorry, the the um, T B S says. So are there very are the variations between the additions of the Texas receptor significant? Okay. okay, so let's just look at the what they said before. <clears throat> so why are various editions called Erasmus, Stevens, etc.? Okay, so they've gone through Complutensian Polyglot, Erasmus, Polonaeus, um, you know, Stephanus's editions, Theodore Beza, Elzevers. Um, Stephanus is best remembered for his 1550 um, edition of 1550. It followed... Erasmus edition, uh, editions of 1527 and 1535, and was the first edition to include marginal variant readings, which were collated from 14 manuscripts and the Greek New Testament of the Complutensian Polyglot. It, it became one of the best known editions of the Texas Receptus, 
called the Royal Edition. It was very popular in England and is still published today in the United States in the form of an interlinear in which is sometimes referred to as the Berry text, which I have there somewhere. Um, <clears throat> this is the one that uh, Maurice Robinson said that he used to read. This is a misnomer because George Rickard Berry simply added the Greek English lexicon to the New Testament and a chapter entitled New Testament synonyms to the edition of Stephen's 1550 text. Yeah, I've, I've read an article where they say it's most of the stuff in that is not Berry, but they just use his name. A bit like Vines is not really the work of Vines. <laughs> it's sort of based loosely on it, but it's actually, um, yeah, that's your Vines there. It's sort of based upon um, uh, Vines, but it, it's got a bunch of other readings from other people in it. Um, one of the most important editions of the Textus Receptus is the Beza edition of 1598. This edition, in addition with the Stevens 1550 and 1551 editions, was used as the Greek basis of the authorised version of 1611. Beza collated and used numerous Greek manuscripts and printed editions in his work and incorporated Jerome's Latin Vulgate and his own Latin and Greek text along with textual annotations. So all he's saying there is Beza had one column was Greek, the next column was Latin, was his own translation, and the next column was the Latin Vulgate to show where there was differences. Are there variations between the editions of the text, sorry, are the variations between the editions of the Texas Receptor significant? No, they, this is Trin Trinitarian Bible Society. These variations include spelling, accents and breathing marks, word order and other minor kinds of differences. As it is stated in the preface to the Trinitarian Bible Society edition of the Texas Receptus, the editions of Stevens, Beza and the Elzevers all present, present substantially the same text and the variations of, are not of great significance and rarely affect the sense. So, you notice there they're not saying Erasmus, Complutensi, or, or any other. So this this sort of is surprising because this is the main thing. But they're only mentioning three editions here. They're not mentioning Erasmus. They're not mentioning the Complutensi and Polyglot. They're not mentioning that anything else. They're saying Stevens, Beza, and Elzebeth are pretty much the same text. The, the, and... Yeah, substantially. They're saying there's differences and their variations are not of great significance between these ones. So it's, it, this is what I find with these critical text guys is oftentimes they're just grabbing a... Like, I know Texas Receptus, King James guys, um, they can do this as well because what people do is they have this you know, false dichotomy. There's these two enemies, you know, and they're, they're all on the same team and all the, all the rest of it. But... At the end of the day, um, you know, I've seen TR people say some really dumb things. I've seen King James people say some really dumb things, but I've seen them say some really smart things <laughs> as well. Um, but what I'm saying with the group that seems to be like, you know, the Mark Ward guys, you know, Elijah Hicks and, you know, these other guys, oftentimes they're taking things out of context like this. And so um, let's, let's just keep reading. So this seems to be the first glaring problem um, is that they're saying that it says here, are the variations between the editions of a Texas Receptus significant? Uh, they answered no. These variations include um, spelling, accents and breathing marks, word order and other minor kinds of differences. And then it says, likewise, the intro into the uh, TBS's TR, Scrivener claims, the editions of Stevens, Beza and the Elzevers all present substantially the same text and the variations are not of great significance and rarely affect the sense. Further along in Anderson and Anderson's article, they asked how many differences are found between the Scrivener text um, of the TBSTR and Stephanus and Beza texts. Um, there are approximately 190 differences between the Scrivener text and Beza's 1598. Um, and that's the one that I'm saying only about 20. So that's, that's the work that I've done here. Only about 20 of those are translatable. Most of them are just insignificant. Like, say, a certain ruler, 
you've got to have the ice there, according to Scrivener. But um, why did all these other earlier English versions have certain ruler, a, a certain ruler there um, without it? They didn't have the ice there. Um, but they, um, Scrivener said, no, we're following the Complutense Polyglot here. It has that reading. Well, why did all these other, you know, before the King James have exactly the same reading? Because it's just Scrivener not understanding how to translate that Greek into English properly. Um, so anyway, I thought I'd just mention that. That's the 190 differences, okay? There are 283 differences between Scrivener's text and the Stephanus 1550. So that's the, that's the one that um, Mark Ward was comparing Scrivener and Stephanus. It's like, why are you going back to Stephanus? Who, who is holding up Stephanus and saying, that's it? Now, I know throughout history, um, people have revered it. Um, the London Polyglot, Walton's Polyglot, um, they use that as their main TR text. Uh, the same as John Mill. Uh, a lot of people did. But the underlying text of the King James is usually what TR people go to and what KJV people go to. So it's just sort of... You know, scholars in the past have gone, we we follow that, um, but we're not doing that today. So these differences are minor, italics added. Okay. Do these claims hold up? I'm not asking about the numbers, though I wonder about those as well, but I am suspicious of the claim that, that, that these differences between Scrivener's TR and that of Beza or Stephanus are only minor. In order either to prove or disprove this claim i've undertaken a project wherein i evaluated the sermon of the mount i made a critical apparatus of various tr editions over against scrivener's tr text of matthew 5 to 7. i consulted over 20 various tr editions more on that below and noted the variance among them compared to scrivener uh, below i'll explain my methodology however this seemed to be the only true test to evaluate these claims. So he's going to 20 editions, but it, did they say all these 20 editions are the same? Any TR KJV person knows Erasmus didn't put the Comiohenium in the first two editions. So we know there's, there's differences, like whole entire verse differences. We know between the 1550 and Visa, there's whole entire verse differences. And so, um, well, the, I would say the Trinitarian Bible Society, um, I would have to read the whole article to get to exactly what they're saying there. But it, it, why would they need to go to 20 different TRs when the Trinitarian Bible Society are basically saying Stevens, Beza, and the Elzevers? Okay, that's what they're saying. Um, okay, so then they're saying later on Scrivener, Stephanus, Beza. Okay, so I mean, the difference between Scrivener and Beza, like I said, I'm, I've been working on that for years. It's about 20 translatable differences. Okay, and it makes you wonder how many of the Stephanus Beza um, issues are translatable. Um, I know that uh, the Appendix E of uh, Scrivener shows that if you want to look at appendix e go to my same page there scroll down to the bottom of the page and you can see appendix e where i've actually sort of written this whole article into the website and um i've also started making a scrivener's uh, 1881 and the 1598 compared but you can see here like passages, passages where the authorized version differs from Stevens and Beza jointly. And it's like, uh, yeah, Edon. And so, um, because Scrivener doesn't realize that um, Euron, uh, that Edon can mean found and saw. And it's actually translated as perceived um, in other places in the King James. Like we're looking at the plural, rabdos, um, beazel, bub. Like we looked at the ice one, just, you know, it's un why didn't the earlier trans translations need that for that reading? Uh, beazel, bub, 
he translates he he actually changes that to be Azul Baal, but only in one place. In other places, it's Beazel Bub. Uh, sorry, it's um, Beazel Bub. No, he puts in Beazel Bub. Sorry, but the Greek actually says Beazel Baal. But they would both be all be translated as Beazel Bub because that's how the English people understood it. One of the rules for the translators was to use the words that were commonly known in English at the time. So a lot of the names, you know, they weren't going to call Paul Paulos. They're just going to call him Paul. They're going to call not Peter Petros. They're going to say Peter. And Beazel Bub was the way that they they called Beazel Bub. You know, and whether you like that or don't that, that or not, that that's how they were in 1611. So it's basically phonetics. Uh, Beth Cider instead of um, Bethesda or something like that, but they both translate the same in English. Uh, this one here is a, is a just a complete error. I've shown that um, uh, in a few videos, and so that's the whole of Matthew. <laughs> Almost no issue there whatsoever. So a lot of these are just non-issues, really. They're, they're just and. What's strange is Mark Ward and many people go to these lists to to look at you know differences between um, you know Stephanus and Visa and and it's like but when you go through it there's really there's hardly any difference and um, most of these are completely untranslatable but they just sort of like the numbers you know it's like oh 190 that's a lot it's like yeah well 170 are pretty much just nothing burgers you bite into it and there's nothing in there um okay so let's get back to this so there are approximately 190 differences between scrivener text and visa there are 200 and, sorry i already read that do these claims hold up He says, um, below I'll, I will explain my methodology. However, this seemed to be the only true test to evaluate these claims. I'm not sure why you would go to 20 different TR editions. Um, and then when we look at the project, like, is that, did they mention Erasmus's editions in that? They didn't. The Aldine edition? No. Look, Erasmus, Aldine, Erasmus, Aldine, Erasmus, Aldine, Erasmus, Aldine, Erasmus. None of these editions here were mentioned whatsoever because the TBS said basically um, the 1550, Beza, and the Elzevers. And then they said St St um, Scrivener later on. So you're looking at four editions. None of them are mentioned here, are they? So... Let's go up here. Complutense and Polyglot. Did they mention that? No. Did they mention Colonnaeus? No. Did they mention... Oh, here we go. Stephanus. The first... We've got one there. Uh, that one's um, Gebelius. That's not included. Erasmus, not included. Al Aldine, not included. Coffell, not included. Uh, Gebelius, not included. Erasmus, not included. No, no, no. None of those are included. The only one is Stephanus there. So you can see why it's like, I'm just like, well, why are you going to 20 TR editions when they clearly said like three and then later on in their article, sort of like they allude to, you know, to basically Beza's text with the 190 changes of Scrivener. Um, why, like none of them there make any difference? Let's look, oh, okay, we've got a Beza reading here. Bees is mentioned. That's great. Um, Complutense and Polyglot, Colonnaeus, Erasmus. So nothing else there. Okay, we've got bees are there. So we do have, okay, that's Matthew 6 1. And so that's quite an, a well known thing. And if you go to uh, Scrivener's Texas Receptus 1881 edition, he actually mentions that in the um, preface. So it's quite a well-known uh, variant. But he actually doesn't mention that it's been changed in his 190 list, which I think is wrong. He should say that it's changed um, there. But he just thinks it's a um, non-translatable issue. 
uh, the Aldine, da, da, da. so none of those are relevant. Um, Bees is relevant. Another Beezer. None of the rest of them. So we've, we've sort of got about five so far, but there's probably been about 30 or 40 mentioned. Uh, bees are relevant. Bees are relevant. And I'm not sure these are really relevant, uh, but because I haven't really done the homework and looked at these differences. But um, I'm just looking at first, the first claims are. Uh, that it's B, the, the text, the 1550 of Stephanus, the text of Beza and the Elzevirs, and then they um, tagged on the text of uh, Scrivener later. So why have all this? What, why, why have all that? You know, that? That would be my first question. And I, I think you would agree that's a pretty normal sort of thing to ask. Like, well, okay, well, they've made these claims and you know they've said here that editions of Stevens, Beza, Beza, and the Elzebers all have the same text. Da da da. And then later on, um, how many differences? Sorry, it says here uh, that there's hardly any any uh, differences between um, the TR editions, and they. They clarify that best by saying Stevens, Beza, and Elzebis basically present the same text. And so I, I just can't understand why they're going to 20 TR editions then when they've only mentioned four. Yeah. Having now completed a collation of the TR editions of the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7, my suspicions were confirmed. From the results of my own study, to claim only minor differences between the various editions is a stretch. Well, uh, if I think you set up a straw man argument because they're saying four editions are similar. But let me get their article up here. Okay, let's have a look. Um, it says, these variations include spelling, accents, breathing marks, word order, and other minor kinds of differences. As it is stated, in the preface to the Trinitarian Bible Society edition of the Texas Receptus, so that's what I'm holding in my hand here, the editions of Stevens, uh, Beza, and the Elzevers all present substantially the same text, and the variations are not. So it seems that these guys are going with these three editions, okay? And so they're saying, okay, they print the text of Scrivener, um, and they're talking about these differences, 190 differences, da, da, da. Okay. And so let's go back to the article. And that would also include between Beza and Stephanus in some places, much less all the other editions among the TR tradition compared with Scrivener's. Indeed, the results of my research yielded that such claims among the TR advocates are patently false. On the other hand, I will readily grant that there is a stabilization among the TR tradition and its various editions. Nevertheless, such stability in the tradition only occurred after much labor and many editions, correcting, editing, and improving upon itself one might say that the task of textual criticism for those in the 1500s and 1600s was a constant one to achieve what they believed to be the best text of the New Testament. So I would agree with that. Um, but when he's saying this is, you know, that these additions, like if they're only reading into that, that one question where it says, are there differences between TR additions? Well, the, the TBS seem to clarify that they're talking about the latter editions. And that's something that, um, that like Jeff Riddle would say. He, he would say, look, I, I don't really even go back to Erasmus. I go from Stephanus to Beza and look at those editions, look at the, the reformers, the Protestant reformers, you know. So, um, Before looking into the details of my findings, so this is under methods and variants noted, 
Perhaps it would be best to explain my decisions for what is and what is not recorded in the apparatus and why. As will be explained below, there are three categories of variants that I compile, drawn primarily from the words and concepts of the claims made by TBS or Anderson and Anderson above. Based on their own assertions and using their own words, see quotes above, we might propose three categories to include in the apparatus. Category one, variants of great significance or major variants that would be translatable. Uh, category two, uh, subtle variants such as spelling that affect the sense. And category three, inconsequential variants not of great significance and that do not affect the sense. Both sources above admit category three variants exist. But what are the other two categories? Category two and category one uh, are either denied altogether or avoided. However, all three of these categories are observed in the TR tradition of the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7. And so um, then we just start going into some of the details. So I'm going to sort of go through because I really want to give a, this video, I want it to be an overview. I don't want to get caught in all the weeds and looking up, you know, um, certain verses here and there. I just want to have a bit of an overview. So if it does get quite technical, I might just play the video. Um, now that you sort of know what the argument is, because I think some people could actually miss what the whole argument is about. So he's basically trying to prove that what the Trinitarian Bible Society say about the Texas Receptus is wrong. Um, I think that they just could have probably worded that a bit better. Um, so when they come to that issue, uh, which I think is this article. No, that's not it. Where did that article go? Received text, Greek New Testament. Here we go. So when they say things like, are the variations between the additions of the Texas Receptor significant? They're like, no. And so I would say what they're comparing that to the critical text. The significant um, differences between the critical text and um, the text of receptors that, that um, numerically they're not as high you know it's 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 pretty much a no-brainer that you have the critical text like even if you were to include the competency of Paul Lott and all, all the rest of them um, the, the numbers are nowhere near the, crit the critical text is its own type of monster. Like even if you were to get the Catholic Bible printed in those days and the Texas Receptus, like the differences aren't as much as what's in the critical text. Like even the Catholics of those days would have been shocked at a lot of the deletions that were ha that happened through Westcott and Hort. Um, you know, the, the Comiohanium gone, you know, and all those sort of things. Like even like bracketing and, and placing down the last 12 verses of Mark and the... And, pay adultery that, that's huge you know so um all of those appear in catholic bibles in this era so um so they say no these variants include spelling accent and breathing marks word order and other minor kinds of differences so to me what these guys have done because they're saying this then they're putting the caveat here as it stated in the preface to the trinitarian bible society edition of the texas receptus and then they go on and mention these three probably what they really need to do is just have a little bit of a thing here or maybe at the beginning where they where they would say um the complutense in polyglot erasmus editions um can differ quite wide, widely, but the additions of Stephanus, Beza and Elzebeth all present substantially the same text. So that would make more sense. Now, I'm basically sort of trying to fight the Trinitarian Bible Society's battle for them and give them the benefit of the doubt here. But at the end of the day, I, I don't have to support them. I, I just go, well, okay, I don't follow Stevens. Now, Beza's uh, 1598 is very very good but i follow the underlying greek text of the king james 
that's what I follow. And so, um, you know, I, I don't have to die on this battlefield at the end of the day, but I do think that here, when they're answering this question, they're clearly stating these three editions. And so I think by going to 20 editions, it's sort of like, well, why go to 20 editions? Um, these guys, even though they've sort of worded it awkwardly, um, you can clearly see that they're saying that those are the three editions to go to. And they're saying that that's what they, they teach at the beginning of this. And so let's have a quick look and see where they say that. Okay, so at the end it says, the editions of Stevens, because they've pointed to this as, you know, go to this and it will show you. Because it has a whole bunch of TR editions all the way through. But then they say, the editions of Stevens, Beza and Elzevers all present substantially the same text. And the variations are not of great significance and rarely affect the sense. The present edition of the Texas Receptus underlying the English authorized version of 1611 follows the text of Beza's 1598 edition as the primary authority and corresponds with the New Testament in the original Greek. Okay, so could they word things a little bit better, you know, um, at the end of the day? End, end of the day, probably. I mean, that's like being printed. How many, I mean, how old is this one that I've got? That's, that's in 97. That's old. But, you know, not old, old, but it's like, you know, I'm sure that probably they had the same intro. Now, I've even picked up where they actually said the, um, the Elziva, and I think they've got brothers, but it says partners, almost like in a different font, pasted on there and a little bit crooked. <laughs> like um, they actually changed that from the Elzeva brothers uh, to Elzeva partners because they're actually uncle and nephew. So they just corrected that. But there's, they're saying three editions. And then apparently later on, they, they include um, the text of Scrivener. Okay. So, of course, while not looking, sorry, of course, while not all categories are of equal weight or importance, they do serve purposes of research. For example, the last category three of inconsequential variance, which amounts to spelling errors or the omission of a final nu and sigma are included in the apparatus. However, so I'm not sure why you would have a final new missing. So because basically when you look at that Scrivener's text, he oftentimes the movable new is just completely untranslatable the vast majority of the time. So he can have a movable new on a word that appears like a hundred times where you get, you just go to Bezos and he doesn't have the new there. And it's, it's sort of like a nothing. It's what, like, why point it out? You know, I mean, good, point it out in your study and, and show it. But it's like, I think that they're including these things to inflate the amount of differences, you know. So they're included in the apparatus. And okay. However, this is primarily for the aid of researchers to track the revision process of certain additions. Okay. So that's fine. As well as to note both progression as well as regression in editorial re refinement. Therefore, nonsensical spellings such as Oh, it's Adelphu. Ath no, no, it's not. Athelfu. Oh, instead of Adelphu. I, I was wondering why I was struggling with that, because it's not a word. <laughs> Adelphu, uh, such as um, Athelfu instead of Adelphu in Beza, but that could just be a typo. Or it appears in two of his editions at Matthew 7 5, see previous footnote, an alternate, although not incorrect in spelling, such as Matthew 25 with Prosser. Prosser Prosser Sepon. 
I'm not sure if that's correct either. Uh, compared to all five editions of Erasmus rendering, um, Prosser Pan are included. Their importance is slight, except for those tracking the development of editorial refinements in the process of the TR tradition. Lest anyone would object to the inclusion of category three variants such as these, I would simply point to those detractors, those detractors to FHA Scrivener's uh, 1860 work with the Stephanus 1550 TR. In this edition, he includes his own critical apparatus of various New Greek New Testament editions. He also noted some of these same slight spelling incongruities among the texts he was studying, including the spelling differences at Matthew 725. However, Scrivener cited this alternate spelling in Tischendorf and Tregellus. It seems only fair to cite Erasmus for the same difference as well as all those like this one. Indeed, this is the same alternative spelling found not only in all five of Erasmus's editions, but also in the Aldine, Coffel, uh, Gerbelius, the Colonnaeus. Likewise, in his apparatus, Scrivener also cited the absence or inclusion of the final sigma, such as Beza's um, 1565 and Elzebeth's uh, 1624 at 1 John 2.6. Um, this is standard operating procedure for such a task as I am setting out to accomplish. So, look, good on this guy for doing his study. That's great. Um, my hat off to him. But it does seem a bit disingenuous that he is trying to correct the Trinitarian Bible Society for mentioning, for just sort of awkwardly wording something where clearly everyone in the TR community, King James community, knows that the first two editions of Erasmus didn't have the Comiohenium in it. So we know there are big differences between that, those two, and every other TR edition. We know that. <laughs> we know that the uh, Complutensian Polyglot has different readings. So we're just like, okay, well, that, that's a historical fact. But to go through and time... And sort of hold us accountable for those and or to even hold the trinity and bible society accountable um for you know saying this in an awkward fashion like perhaps they could have said this first as it stated in the preface da 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 uh, and then say um that these variants in these editions um are not really significant but even then, I would hold to task that I think the Texas Stevens and Visa has differences, okay? And so <clears throat> I guess in a way it's like I'm trying to, I'm trying to just see they, the author of this would have been better off just saying, I'm just doing a, a study into the differences between the TRs. What they're trying to do is make out that the Trinitarian Bible Society are being disingenuous. But the see the Trinitarian Bible Society don't have a strict sense like I do. Like <clears throat> I'm looking at the differences between Scrivener and Beza in the um, 190 list, where these guys say the 190 list is um, valid, it's true, um, where I'm like, no, the 190 list, 170 of them are probably not even worth changing they don't they don't change anything they just it's just phonetics so what why do it yeah you know, or it's either phonetics or it's to do with headings you know um so so why change it what why why have this you know issue where these guys are saying that the 190 list is genuine and so um so, yeah, uh, there's a lot that I would disagree with with the Trinitarian Bible Society on those issues, on the minutia, um, especially things like the LXX um, being a pre-Christ document that Jesus used and the apostles used. I would say that that's wrong. 
But see, these guys could hold that against all TR people too and just go to the LXX article and say, look, they believe that the Septuagint was before Christ and then go, but TR people today don't believe that. Oh, what's their problem? Well, it's because we're all free, independent thinkers. Um, you probably, if you're a born-again Christian, you probably believe in young earth creationism. Now, if I was to say, okay, you are you believe in the Hovind theory then, you go, oh, no, 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 I follow more of an answers in Genesis thing or I follow my own rule, you know. it's You don't have to tie yourself to any group, you know. And so, but um, I'll, you can agree with I'll, the vast majority of things that are being said, but everyone's got their own quirky little thing. Trinitarian Bible study been around for a long time. I could I could go through this stuff and point out where there's wrong things. And some things I disagree with. Sometimes I don't think they go far enough. Sometimes sometimes I think they're too strict on certain things. And so, but um, at the end of the day, just looking at the motivation behind this whole entire article, it does seem to me that there's only you know, three mentioned here. And then they mention the Scrivener later on um, and basically say that that's sort of, you know, basically the, the text of Beza anyway with just a few changes. And so four texts, but then he's going to 20, 22 texts. So, <clears throat> but I'll keep reading. Other category three, three variants are more important for study. Though they are both minor and not translatable, variation of word order or variants of verbs with the same cognate root, but leave off the prepositional prefix may not affect the sense in English. See apparatus at Matthew um, 7.2 or 7.28. However, if one were to object that these variants should not be included, we would only point them to those TR advocates who make much of every jot and tittle. So there are some TR advocates like myself who make much of every jot and tittle. I, I believe that every jot and tittle is very important. Um, I think that uh, critical text people and a lot of majority text people use jot and tittle um, talking about the Greek, where really that's specifically talking about the Hebrew and talking about the construction of Hebrew words in that context so that's why when you you talking about things they're like every jot and tittle in the greek it's like well most of the jots and tittles in the greek when it's talking about you know smooth breathings rough breathings um, you know accent marks that, that they weren't in existence so the greek language was very different in the first century uh when it was written down it was just letters mostly um often they object to assertions of no major doctrine affected by textual variants by retorting, what about the doctrine of bibliology? Well, let us hold the TR to the same standard. These variants must also be included to give a full-throated examination of the claims made by TR proponents of the TR tradition. But see, the thing is, I don't know. Um, at the end of the day, like I said, most people are saying they follow this or they follow the 1598 of or they're saying they follow the Texas Receptus underlying the King James that never got printed, but it's close. You know, th this is this is very good, but you know, no, not hundred percent, but you know, ninety nine point no 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 percent good. You know, um, like say the final Amen on the Book of Ephesians isn't there. You know, in this. So some people just write it in, you know, because it's in visas. Um, now, it was a misprint in the um, 1611, but um, later editions have it, and we still have it there today. So most people agree that it should be in there. Scrivener's like, no, it shouldn't be in there. And so that's his prerogative. Um, we go, well, we think it should be in there. So it's it's not it's not a huge difference. And most of these are, are known issues, you know. So most most people are going to these so why are we talking about all this you know so i guess this is a claim that the trinitarian bible society have made but i think they're blowing it out of proportion by going everywhere else um instead of just these four that they mentioned perhaps the trinitarian bible society could reword that clear it up a little bit 
but I think if you read the preface to this and then you read their full article, you don't come to the conclusion that they're just defending Erasmus's addition, the Complutense and Polyglot, and some of these who he's saying, like, you've never really heard of. The Kopfell and the Gerbelius. I mean, you know, are TR advocates saying that oh, they're good additions? You know what I mean? They're going to them. How many people are going to the Aldine edition? How many people are going to Colonnaeus's edition? No, no one. I don't know any TR advocate who is going to them and saying, well, that's exactly what I think the reading is. People might go to them out of, you know, just doing a study. But it's like me saying, okay, who's going to the Coverdale Bible to get their, you know, English readings? Most people go, oh, I don't go there. I go to the King James, you know. So you might have, you know, the King James 1611. You might have the Blaney edition. You might have, um, you know, the, the 1900 Pure Cambridge edition, but they're all King James editions, you know. So that's pretty much what these guys are saying here is um, they've got, you know, their main three editions and they add the fourth one. So they're saying there's not much differences between them. Now, I would say there is differences between them because I'm a fussy guy and I look at all the minutia. But like I said, they're, they're, they're looking at something from a, a little bit further out and saying, but they are admitting there's differences, but they're saying they're not substantial. And I guess when you're saying substantial, you have to clarify that with everything else that's written in that article when they're talking about the critical text having so many words taken out, so many differences. Well, obviously, they're going to call something that's way, way smaller as not much difference, you know, so... <clears throat> Okay, so he's talking about bibliology. And then he's saying, well, let us hold the TR to the same standard. These variants must also be included to give a, a full-throated examination of the claims made by TR proponents of the TR tradition. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, I just say, I've got my TR. Um, if there's differences between that and earlier editions, I, I pretty much every article that I ever do, I point that out. So it's sort of like being held guilty for showing you got the King James, but then you have the Geneva has differences. It's like, yeah, because um, he is just sort of including like every all the TR proponents, you know, TR proponents of the TR tradition and all this sort of stuff. Um, anyway, let's move on from there. The second category of variants mentioned by the TR proponents above would be minor variants, such as uh, spelling discrepancies. However, these slight errors or what the Andersons describe as minor kinds of differences are only minor to the un uninitiated. Um, Nevertheless, these minor variants do affect the sense, especially the grammatical sense. They're often caused by subtle, slight spelling variations that may even be uh, orally identical. On numerous occasions at the SOTM, there are cases where the bolo word group would vary between the second arrowist form with one lambda to the present form with two lambdas the difference being important for discussion of verbal aspect. Noting such variant uh, variance for category two is the norm for such a critical apparatus. And so, um, you know, saying bolo, um, you know, meaning like I throw or um, you have the, the concepts of binding and loosing um, probably used there. So you have, sometimes it has the one lambda, sometimes it has the two lambdas. And this can be a difference. Like we look at the issue in um, Matthew uh, chapter 1, verse 18, with the Genesis with two news or one new. This can cause people to 
believe that uh, Genesis 1 1 reads um, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, where it actually reads the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. So it's not a genealogy of Jesus, it's a genealogy of um, Joseph. But um, that starts in verse 2. Verse 1 is just talking about this is a book all about what Jesus did, this is a book all about what Jesus generated, this is a book. Um, talking about um, what followed after Jesus came into the world, you know, sort of thing. Then now let's talk about his stepdad who was cursed and had a cursed lineage and no one from his lineage was going to sit on the throne of David because of Jeconiah. And so you, when you have the genealogy, when you make that the genealogy of Jesus Christ, you're attacking the virgin birth, you're saying that Jesus was related to this cursed guy who would never sit on the throne of David. It's actually designed to, to prove that Jesus was not related to what people, who people supposed was his father. Both Scrivener and I um, cited the variant spelling of the Elzebers 1624 at Matthew uh, 634. Not as the Tiaz um, Mary Nesete uh, arrow subject subjunctive, but as Mary Nesete future indicative. They seem very, very similar. I can't even see a change there. Anyway, uh, finally, I guess, you know, where it's appearing. Um, Finally, there is the inclusion of major variants, category one. Here we mean variants such as omissions, additions, and alternative wordings that are translatable. Most, even those not conversant with New Testament Greek will recognize these. Um, that there are a limited number of these speaks to the TR traditions relatively, um, relative stability in its development. However, that these exist at all also speaks to the concept that there is not just one TR tradition. And these men were always refining and improving the current Greek New Testament of their day. It also means that the quoted claims above are factually verifiably false. Well, just because they said that it's pretty much the same text is very similar. When you can compare, you know, the critical text with the with a TR, there's not major differences. So, you know, you might get, so Trinitarian Bible Society is sort of like, well, the difference between an iPhone 11, 12, and 13, not much difference. But if you're a, a tech geek, you would say there's thousands of differences. They, they, you know, they change this and the way that apps work and the way that you, you, you open up your maps and think, you know, that's all changed and the camera at the front and this and that, and it's like, but the users just sort of like, well, and so the Trinitarian Bible Society, um, they're just sort of summarizing it in the light of um, if you were to say, well, the difference between like a Nokia of 10 years ago and a Samsung today, there's a huge difference. So, so that's the sort of difference that we're talking about when we're looking at the critical text. But when we're looking at the Texas receptors, we're looking at fine little minutia. And, the, and they pretty much almost look the same. You, you, you have to really go through and study with a fine tooth comb to find differences between you know, those four additions that they've mentioned. But you know, he's adding, like, he's putting 22 additions there. It's like, okay, you, yeah, you're bound to find errors, you know, between, between those. But even I would be more fussy. I'm one of those tech geeks. I would find those little bits of differences but I don't think they're actually being dishonest. I think they just don't have um, the fine um, sense that they're not as sensitive as I am. <laughs> I'm a sensitive guy. I get offended really easy. No, it's there are tiny little tweaks that sometimes I see changes eschatology, changes soteriology changes like even i'm the type of guy who does a study between the, the king james and the new king james and shows the differences and i've found like 500 differences just in the new testament okay 
so when I'm going th through TR editions, I'm like, that's different, that's different. And but someone just coming in and looking at these things at arm's length, they can go, look, look at all the similarities, you know. And that seems like what Mark Ward does. He's like, because it's quite amazing. Mark Ward will say, look at the similarities between the critical text and the text of the receptors on my website, KJV Parallel Bible. There's hardly any differences, and it's like, actually, there's heaps of differences. But then we've got to go with a fine tooth comb through these TR editions, and it's like, see, where um, there are huge differences, and it's just sort of like, so they're trying to sort of hold these guys accountable, okay, for what they've said. Okay, we'll, we'll keep reading. Perhaps they've got a case. You know, I'm just not really feeling that much, but I'm not supporting the, T, the Trinitarian Bible Society to the back teeth either. I think they do a lot of good work, um, you know, and... Um, I've been in contact with them for many years over the, the, the translation work that I've been involved with overseas. And so um, they're, they're nice guys. They're very approachable. Um, when I was doing Revelation 16.5, talked to Larry Brigden, nice guy, very intelligent guy. Um, and so I, I definitely wouldn't be against them, but um, I'm, I don't have to support everything they say in an article, you know. <clears throat> okay so now one may object that the slight spelling variations for the personal pronouns should be included in category two rather than category one at that point we're simply quibbling over numbers stacking up the numbers for category one versus category two however while these are usually differentiated by switching the Eta for the Ypsilon or vice versa. Nevertheless, these changes are translatable differences. Um, therefore, I choose to include them in my findings for category one. And as they happen in notable places, such as in the Lord's Prayer, this would constitute as a major change. So imagine hearing your father who is in heaven as Beza. 1582, 1588, and 1598 reads. Now, I am going to absolutely check this to the back teeth because I don't think that um, the the 1598 reads that way. I just I, I, I just can't see that. Actually, I might even just jump. I said I wouldn't do this, but I might actually be tempted to jump into the text of Visa. So let's just jump into books. <clears throat> if you know how to navigate my site you can just go to books and you can um, download actually if I just go to if I type in E here go straight to Beza how's that okay so we are at Lord's Prayer so that's in Matthew 6 let's go to Matthew we might skip a few of these pages. Um, okay, we're on 36. We might go to 44. We'll see how that goes. Okay, we're on Matthew 2 there. Maybe 85. <clears throat> okay, gone a bit far, but we'll get there. Maybe 70. Okay, so Matthew 7. Getting closer. So the Lord's Prayer, I think it starts about 10. See, the great thing about Beza's work, if you, I, I know some people are listening to this, but just picture with me. On one, on the left-hand side, you've got the Greek, say, verse 6, you've got the Greek on the left-hand side. Then in the middle, you've got his own uh, Texas Receptus translation into Latin, including italics and everything. And so... Um, 
and then you have the Latin Vulgate, so you can compare these. So the Pater Noster, so that's where you'd have um, the Father in heaven. Okay, so they're saying, says your Father in heaven. Now, it's going to take me quite a while because what, what you can do with this, you can go through um, grabbing the Greek, which I might just, I might just quickly, I'll see if I can do this quickly. If not, I'll move on because I don't want to bore everyone sitting here for half an hour typing in a whole bunch of stuff. So I'll go to my website, tr.org.au. And we'll go to Matthew 6. I'll just show you what I'm doing for those who are a little bit bored. And so I might read some of these comments um, before they fade away. So Terry said, that's just what I wanted. Thanks for that. Um, this confusion of including 20 editions is rather than focusing on the ones quoted by the TBS seems really, really daft. Yeah, I know. It's, I was sort of expecting that I would find that, but I didn't really, I, I was hoping that it would sort of, they would explain that away, you know, and just say, look, we understand they're only pointing at these four, but we thought we'd do these other ones, you know, as well, you know, and we bolden the ones that they say, you know, are the other ones that they think are similar um but they didn't they just sort of said these guys are liars you know in a, in a roundabout way you know so these guys are not really being honest you know they should be critiquing themselves as much as they critique us sort of thing by all means study the diff study the differences in 20 editions but don't then begin the article with the tbs quote baffling disingenuous even yeah i think so so we've got Dwayne Green in the house, just living the dream. And so we'll probably um, check out Dwayne's video soon. I've already gone for two hours. Um, Helg says that the Trinitarian Bible Society Greek TR with the forward was published in uh, 1976. Yeah. So that's that one. First published in 1976. So that's the, the forward there. Hasn't been changed since then. Um so you know obviously new things come to light ways of saying things that don't upset certain groups you know like the mark ward types you know um, i'm sure that they could word things a little bit better or just you know uh, my copy was printed in 1985 man you are you are showing your age help the old setup old school um, these are young people who have just discovered the differences between the early printings of the Great New Testament. Just let them have their fun with it. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like that. It's like um, when Mark Ward come on the scene and he's like, do you know there's hard words in the King James? And I'm sort of like, we're, we, you know, I'm there with Will Kinney and Stephen Avery and all these old doggers, and I'm just like, I think we sort of already realized that and, you know, people are making, Trinitarian Bible Society is making lists of these defined King James Bibles, you know, trying to, you know, explain these. And Mark Ward's like, this is a shock horror, you know. You didn't know that, did you? You never read the preface. It's like, uh, no, I'm studying the preface, you know. I've read it, yeah, probably well over 100 times. I, well, I actually used to listen to it every morning because they said, King James TR people don't know the preface. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to know the preface backwards. And so I would just listen to an audio of it on fast speed, though, and listen to it over and over and over until it just sort of became like, yeah, that's what they're talking about. And it was very clear what they were saying. And it was like, uh, then they were bringing out books and you, you guys, the forgotten preface. And it's like, who's forgetting about this? Like, who? <laughs> you know, anyway. <clears throat> We're looking at the Lord's Prayer here. So I just want to be very quick. Uh, after this man of prayer, our Father which art in heaven. So let's have a look at the at the Greek. 
I'll see if I've done <clears throat> any fancy work here. Sometimes I have done an article, um, depending on usually if there's a massive variant here. I'm not sure of any massive variant there. There might be an article on verse 13. Um, it's a little bit slow, but we're getting there. Okay, so I've got this there. I'm pretty sure that's the addition of Theodore Beza. Um, okay, so... Let's just throw that into translate. Our... <clears throat> So it's our father, or father of our. Okay, I'll just see if I've got any differences in TR editions here. No, I haven't put in all that information. Um, but let's look at how it's been translated, because the 1598 was followed by the King James, our father, our father. Um, our father. All the editions just have our father, our father, our father, our father, our father. Okay. All the English editions up to the King James as well. Um, so maybe I'll look at Bible Hub. Um, Actually, I'll just type in Matthew 1 9. Sorry, Matthew 6 9. We can go to Bible Hub. <clears throat> now, when you're looking at different editions of the Greek, when you go to Bible Hub, I know I've shown this a few times, but you go down the very bottom and it says additional parallel Greek. So you click on that. And it has Beza's 1598 here. Um, okay, so he's saying there is a very large difference here where it says, instead of our father, which art in heaven, it has your father, which art in heaven. Okay. So uh, I can't see any difference between, but I know there's errors in this. Okay. If you look up Luke 2.22, it has the critical text reading. It doesn't have Beza's reading which is strange. I don't know why they've done that. Um, I've, I'm sure that someone could write to these guys and get them to correct it. But um, anyway, so we're looking at differences between, you know, our father. It does not say uh, your father, which is in heaven. So I'm just suspicious on that. As soon as I saw it, I just thought it's, it just doesn't seem right. Um Okay, we're looking at the original here. Um, now, it is in a ligature. A ligature is just a fancy, fancy way of writing something. But usually you can just, um, you can work through this. You can, you can work it out. So, um, Amon, now if I go to my ligatures, uh, let's just quickly go there. Um, but as far as I can see, that is Amon. This is the reading. Okay, so this is the correct reading. Uh, I'll go to books. Now, he might talk about this in the video, or he might talk a little bit, bit about this later. But... Um, I'll just show you clearly what it reads. And so we're going to go to this website here. So ligatures of early printed Greek. And most of the issues that you struggle with, uh, with reading um, Beza, Stephanus, you, you can find this on my website under books. If you go to the front page, type in books, 
and then it's got all these fancy things at the bottom here we go okay so This is exactly what I said I wouldn't do. <laughs> okay. However, while these are differentiated by the ETA, switching the ETA for the Upsilon or vice versa, uh, nevertheless, these changes are translatable differences. Yeah, but they could also be print errors. Um, okay, so he's saying uh, the ETA... Or is it just that it's a ligature and he's not really understanding it? Um, okay. Um, uh, okay. Dun, dun, dun. Still looking for it. Yeah, maybe it doesn't have the whole word there. So what am I actually looking for? I'm looking for... This one here looks like a little butterfly. So that would be under Moo, I guess. Um, okay, yeah, that looks like MA. Uh, Menos. There we go. An M. And an Omicron. Okay, so I found the little ligature, and even that the mu, um, the Omega, sorry, I said Omicron, the Omega and the nu, um, is exactly that ligature there. Okay, so we can clearly see that what those letters are, which is pretty cool. And but the letter in front that's what he's talking about, so it's either a upsilon um, with a breathing mark or it's an eta. So, um, okay, so I'm just trying to find. The difference here okay so i would say that that is just a print error would would you say that um i don't think that that's saying um now the good thing is we can check everything with the latin translation that he supplies and also a lot of the time you'll find him mentioning these in his annotationis down the bottom. So it might say, uh, like verse nine here. So he's talking about, um, so he doesn't mention it, which is unfortunate because um, sometimes it's mentioned and then it just solves it. It's, it's, oh, it's a print error, you know. So, but um, we've just got to, look at this uh, either a Upsilon or a Eta 
we've just got to look at these and see whether this ligature can be whether this is a ligature as well um So I think this is something that I'm going to have to look into myself because it's just, yeah, it's getting late. I've got a bit of brain fog. And so, um, but I can see what he's saying. Okay. It's got a, it looks like an Upsilon with a breathing mark on it. So I'll just have to look at other um, places where this appears. So um, like, okay, here we have what, it's exactly the same word down here. I'm pretty sure in verse 11. Um so I'll just quickly go to um, the Scribner's text. Let's open that up. Matthew 6, uh, 11. So I'm just showing in the Scriveners where this appears a few times. So that's what Scriveners has. Now Scriveners is a reflection of Beezus as well. So it would be interesting to see what Scrivener has to say about that. So it appears here, here, and here. Um, yeah, hello be your name, your kingdom come, you'll be done. Give us this day our the art on our daily bread forgive us our debts um, that type of thing so we can see here that that is this that is supposed to be the same word as there now my first instinct would be that that is a typo okay um, typos appear in Beza's text if you look at the last reference to God, I think it is in the book of Revelation. It has it's 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 missing, but it's in the Latin and it's in a footnote. So you can tell it should be there. So most editions just leave that just put it in and go, oh, it's just a typo. Um but yeah, usually what I would do, so this is what I will do, is I'll go through the earlier editions of Beza. Because apparently he is saying that this appears in the 1582, 1588, and the 1598 as your father in heaven. Okay. But is that exactly how Beza translates that? And so um, I, I don't see any English Bible translate like using Beza's and translating it that way at all, ever. Um so my, fir my first gut instinct is that it's a typo, okay? And sometimes typos can run in various editions. We saw this with, um, I, I remember Brian Ross was talking about uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 25, and the, I think it was the conjunction there was also, or um, the K there, you know, was that there? And then I proved that it was... Um, a typo in Beza's text and yeah and so I, I just showed you know how it should basically be in there um but it was interesting how you get there because you got the the greek you got the latin and so this is a representation of that so this is like having the king james next to it and you're reading it going well but this is an, an exact representation because this is Beza's own translation and then you have the Vulgate, sometimes it reads the same, but then you have the annotations at the bottom and sometimes they have a lot to say about things as well. So unfortunately, in verse 9 here, it doesn't say that much, um, but it's just talking about the holy, you know, your hallowed be thy name sort of thing. So, but you might find um, 
See, and the thing is too, if there is a difference between editions, usually Visa talks about it. And so if he ha if he's not talking about it, chances are, well, that's a good place where you could say that that's an, just a typo. And so anyway, I'll look more into that. So I think what we'll do, um, no, we'll keep going through this article. Okay. So, so he's saying these are translatable differences. Therefore, I choose to include them in my findings for category one. Um, as they happen in notable places, such as the Lord's Prayer, when this would constitute as a major change. Imagine hearing your father who is in heaven. Like, I just think that, you know, I'll, I'll do all the homework on that. I'll do an article on it and I'll pretty much show that it's a print error because I just know my gut feeling is I've done you know, 100 of these before. Um, <clears throat> but I'll just read down to this category one. Um, place because then they start to go through you know a lot of these places which I'll go through um, and I'll check out any significant things but what we want to do is we just sort of want to get a brief in this session so a word also needs to be said about the additions I examined and what I would consider under the TR tradition moniker so you might actually redeem himself a little bit here okay the names most commonly associated with the TR tradition would begin with Erasmus and be followed by Stephanus Beza and the Elzevers, number eight. Um, so, According to my fellow colleague and TR advocate, Jeff Riddle, he said in response to the question of um, which TR, with the following clarification, the additions should be primarily consulted are the classic Protestant ones of Stephanus Beza based on Erasmus's foundational work. The Elzevir editions should also be consulted, but with the understanding that they appeared after most of the translations of the TR had first been made into the modern languages of Europe. Okay. So that's what Jeff Riddle, and I've heard Jeff Riddle say that. Basically, Jeff Riddle says he goes with these two, um, but he he doesn't really go with Erasmus, but he just says it's based on Erasmus. Okay, so he's just giving probably more information than he needs to. It's basically he goes with these two, and so um. Okay, let's get back up here. Um. <clears throat> However, Scribner himself also included the Complutensian Polyglot, 1514, 1522, Aldine Aldus, 1518, the Colleen Colonnaeus, uh, 1534, in his plain introduction. Even the Trinitarian Bible Society TR Scribner's printed edition that I personally own mentioned the Complutensian Polyglot and Colonnaeus editions. I therefore find justification to include them in my consultation. I have also included um, and I think the end should be dropped there. Uh, Gabellius, uh, 1521, and Coffell, uh, 1524. Is that the Wolf edition? I think that might be the Wolf edition. Um, I think I mentioned that. I didn't think I did, but it's just under a different name, I think. I think it's um, Wolf Coffell. I call it the Wolf edition for some reason. In my examination to see early iterations of the TR tradition, as well as to consider those in contact with Erasmus who may have befriended Luther and Melanchthon at some point. Um, others would have been added, but these are the primary voices that would eventuate in what some refer to as the mature Protestant TR tradition. As a side note, I only consulted Beza's major folio editions. I could not obtain access to examine a copy of the Elzevers, or the Elzevers 1641 edition. At the end of the text and apparatus, I include a list of 22 editions collated in comparison to Scrivener. Okay, so then he's got the details. And I've just, I've, I did an article on uh, Matthew 6 1, I think about maybe two months ago, and just so happened that he's bringing this up now. 
I, I don't I don't even know why I brought it up, but um, I was just reading in the um, the preface, and I saw I saw the issue, and I thought, well, that's an interesting thing to to think about. Um, so he goes through all those issues. Okay, so we might just read the final observations. Um, okay. The TR tradition is very stable and, and consistent tradition. In fact, the more quotable portion of the SOTM, such as the Beatitudes, uh, were virtually, there were virtually no variants of any kind. However, I was surprised by my findings. If we do not conclude in the counting those instances of final nu and sigma in category three, which I did not above, I would have anticipated that this third category would have been the largest and the major translatable variance category one to be the smallest yet it was the opposite by my counting there were 32 category one variants 28 category two variants and 22 category three variants just within the SOTM um, even further I was shocked by the 32 category one variants that is far more than I anticipated and perhaps more than we were led to believe by those TR advocates uh, quoted above. The SOTM uh, contains 111 verses of varying length. Um, that there exists 32 major variants, category one and 28 minor variants that nevertheless affect the sense, Category 2, leading to a staggering 16 meaningful variants of 111 verses. That means among the TR tradition, for every two verses of the SOTM, there is either a translatable variant or a variant that affects the Greek grammar and interpretation, even if slightly. Indeed, these numbers are much higher than, than TR advocates indicate, such as those quoted above. It was said that these variations in, include spelling, accents and breathing marks, word order and other kinds of differences. And the additions of Stevens, Beza and the Elzevers all present substantially the same text and the variations are not of great significance and rarely affect the sense. Presumably, they would respond to the objection that most of these 60 differences in category one and two are not truly part of the mature Protestant TR tradition. So obviously, <laughs> this is like an argument Jeff Riddle says. Trinitarian Bible Society seem to be saying the same thing. So, yes, presumably they would say that, and that's why I'm like, well, why are you sort of misrepresenting here? Um, <clears throat> while that is the case with a good many of the variants, Bees's various folio editions created nine variants, six of which were Category 1. So we're going to look at all these. And see, the thing is, uh, according to the differences between that and Scrivener, yeah, 6-1 and Scrivener, Scrivener changed it unnecessarily. So I go with the underlying Greek text of the King James Version and the choices that they made. So um, it'll be interesting to see all these, you know, wh whether they're just um, changes that, because I believe Scrivener changed it. Um, Westcott and Hort changed their text there as well. But he didn't mention that he changed it in his um, apparatus at the end. So he mentions it in his preface, which is strange. But And a single category two variant uh, in 544 of Stephanus's two recorded variants, he created a single category two variant, um, 528, and a single category three variant, um, 627, and even the Elzevers contributed a Category 2 variant, um, 634, as Scrivener also cited. If we were to include Erasmus's variants, that number increases exponentially, even more so with the Complutensian Polyglot, Aldine, Colonnaeus editions, all listed in Scrivener's explanation of the early TR tradition. So is he not mentioning those here in this article?
it's quite confusing exactly what he's done. But he's saying he's comparing you know, 22 editions. Um, <clears throat> this exercise of collating the editions within the TR tradition yielded results I was not expecting, but it did confirm a suspicion. A critical apparatus for the TR would be a wonderful tool and aid for research. So we've heard this for years and years and years. Like, why don't they do a TR with a critical? It's because we see that it's a progr progress. Like, why would you want all the readings of the Nestle um, 7th edition? Would you want all the marginal readings then showing the Weymouth, showing the Weiss text, showing Tischendorf? Show, you, you sort of moved on from there. You know what I mean? We've, we've moved on from all that, you know. Um, however, it would only come to us by an extremely laborious project of worth worthwhile endeavor. For a project like this to be completed, it would require the backing of a publisher or academic institution to fund those doing the slow task of such collating. For instance, I would love for someone to go through these same 22 editions and check my work. For the SOTM, what did I leave out? What did I incorrectly include? What did I get wrong? Um, I do not claim inerrancy on my research. Well, I'm going to go through your research with a fine tooth comb and we're going to check it out. And we're going to put it out publicly and let people know if there is error or if there, um, what needs to be said. Um, I, you know, most, most of the time I'm doing this sort of work on my website anyway. So it'll, it'll just be, I'll just look up places where he's got these, um, you know, variants in printed texts and I'll just put the, put that information there and I'll work it out. And so uh, looking at 22 editions of the TR, um, usually I might look at, you know, 10 editions or something like that. M yeah, most of the time they're saying the same thing. But um, we'll check all that out. As to what this might mean for ardent supporters of the Texas Receptus, I'm not sure. I personally do not use the TR for other text critical reasons, although my own church preaches and reads publicly from the New King James Version. So to me, that's just utter confusion because if it, I think this guy's majority text, but they're reading the New King James. So you would see that a lot of the readings of the New King James are apocryphal or something, or just it shouldn't be there. But um, however, this may give pause to those who want to claim stability for the TR on the one hand, while at the same time um, level and instability among the critical texts on the other. Additionally, with most of the variants in the TR tradition being toward the beginning of the process, Erasmus, Complutensian Polyglot, Aldean, etc., this demonstrates the need for printed editions to continually refine itself. Um, well, no, we we believe that you can refine something till it's perfect. And so um, there's only so far you can go, like if you're um, refining oil or you, if you're, you're refining something, you, you get to the point where you can run it through the refiner again and again, and then that's it. The King James translation they worked on the text of Beza. Now that had been through a lot of refinement um, with the Greek text, but also with other language texts and also with Beza's Latin translation. The translators of the King James were very well equipped to do their own Texas Receptus edition. Now they basically took their hat off to Beza and said, we are going to follow you 1598. Um, now there's 20 places out of thousands and thousands and thousands of words in the in the new testament we're going to choose 20 places that we think um you haven't gone far enough or maybe he's overstepped the line and put in something that they weren't in agreement with and so they've formulated their own edition of the tr um underlying king james now had they printed a parallel greek text that would have been great but Scrivener, 250 years later, he's gone, okay, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, Westcott and Port said that. But, um, yeah. 
so I, I just sort of find it confusing that people would read the New King James Version. I mean, I can point out so many errors just off the top of my head with the New King James. Um, I mean, yeah, anyway, let's just continue on. However, this may give pause to those who want to claim a stability for the TR on one hand, and while at the same time level instability among the critical texts on the other. Additionally, with most of the variants in the TR tradition being toward them. So I actually read that. Um, this demonstrates the need for printed editions to continually refine itself. We should not be critical when the NA text reaches the 29th edition. This is part of the task. And those involved in the editing and printing of the TR tradition were involved with this as well. Um, well, I would say that the NA, NA text, the 29th edition, to, I just can't understand why. Like, to me, this shows the, the confusion of the author because I think he's a majority text guy. Okay. Then you've got him, the church is reading a Texas Receptus based Bible. But he's saying we shouldn't criticize the NA twenty eight guys because they're just they're just refining their text. So which one is it? You know, um, I mean, uh, uh, you know, apparently he is going to say this in a later sort of thing. Now I will have to go through some of these footnotes um, and double check a few things, but. Yeah, it, it does sound very confusing. It does sound very much like what Mark Ward would say, like all Bible translations are okay. And so um, to me, they're not okay. Um, I, like if he was saying, okay, I'm, I'm a TR advocate and I read the New King James, I go, okay, well, I can show you where there's translational errors in there. But at the end of the day, at least it's based on a TR for the most part. You know. Um but I mean, even the NA the NA 29th edition, the changes that were in the 28th, like say, Second uh, Peter um, chapter three verse ten, with the CBGM uh, reading of Uk there, most people have rejected that and they don't want that reading in there. So James White's saying, I don't want that reading in there. He throws it out, but most people throw it out. So it doesn't give you much confidence that the CBGM is going to be any help to the future of Bible translation. Um, he says, I am tremendously thankful to Elijah Hickson uh, for helping me to gain access to these editions as well as his input. Um, so what I think I'll do, um, I was going to go through the video in this one, but I'll make this one a part one. Then I'll go through the video like part two. And But I think it's important that we did go through this article because it creates a lot of groundwork here um okay so <clears throat> okay so um matthew 6 1 so that's good i've um been looking at that recently so um, i've sort of got my finger on the pulse with that We'll talk about that as it comes up. So maybe some of these comments, I'll quickly look at these, uh, the comments on the uh, um, actual website that this article is on. Uh, Timothy looks like a great project. I only had a few moments to skim the initial proposal, but I'm looking forward to reading through this. Dwayne Green, he's talking about um, the arrowus and the future indicative. He's sort of like, why is it in a certain category? Okay, um, and I thought the same thing. Uh, inter interesting research, but I think most TR advocates are likely not to be convinced since they typ typically look for a final form. Yeah, and that's that's sort of what I'm saying. It's like, you know, we're, we're, we're holding up what we consider to be the TR final edition, and they're going right back. Like, I don't say to these guys, so what about Luckman? Luckman had this silly reading in it, um, that's a critical text edition. So you guys are saying you're critical text guys. You, why don't, you know, are you going to follow Luckman? It's got all these differences in it. You know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I don't even go back to NA editions, you know, the, 
sometimes I might just out of general curiosity or it's got a weird reading. It's like, oh, can you believe it had that in it? But um, anyway, so. <clears throat> so they go to the final form, regardless if it's a um, KJV or Scrivener edition. So I think Dwayne Green is listening and understanding our position. So kudos to Dwayne. I think if they're honest, they'll acknowledge some of the category one and two variants. But with that said, I think that we'll find that they will uh, relinquish them as un unimportant status. But, um, because for the TR KGV advocate, it's not the journey that's important. It's the final edition that they have in their hands. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, the it was a process. I don't know. I don't understand why it's such a big deal for people to say yes. There er, there are earlier editions of the text of the receptors, and things got refined. Like I know people go, like some King James advocates go. There were seven periods of purification and all this stuff, and I, I don't gel on all that. But it was refined. The doctrine was like internal investigation happened, looking at the Old Testament, understanding the way that Hebrew um, idioms were carried over in such say like in the book of Matthew, that, 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 that can cause the translation of the Greek to be affected. And um, the more that people understood these things, the more that um, things got translated better. And the, they were looking at more and more manu manuscripts. And so um, having a final edition, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Like, yeah, to, to go, like, if I was to go, okay, which is the best English edition? If I was to go to Geneva, well, I have to accept Jacob in Matthew chapter 1, who's not in any modern Bible, he's not in the King James, but he's there, or the Bishop's Bible has it as well, Jacob. I don't want Jacob in my Bible. <laughs> I, I don't want an extra dude in a genealogy somewhere. Um, I, I want you know, the correct genealogies, you know, and so... If you were to line up all the Bibles, I would go, well, which one has the error in it? So, oh, Geneva and the bishops. Which one doesn't have it? Well, King James. And so that's just what I've done with a lot of these issues. Well, King James is right again. It's right again. It's right again. And in the end, it's like, well, this is the one that I choose. And so obviously, you would look at the English Bibles and say there was a purification process in the English Bibles up until 1611. There was a purification process of the Texas Receptus up until 1611. Just as it, there would have been a purification process just to put what's in print onto computers or say onto the internet. When you go from one technology to another, there is a purification process. So I'm sure someone probably scanned in a, a copy of the King James. Now, they might have copied the Oxford edition, okay? which people say, oh, you know, there's a few capitalization issues and a few italic issues that aren't good or whatever. And it's like, okay, well, they put that one up there. And maybe that was on the internet for like three or four years and everyone was copying and pasting that. And then someone went, hang on, this is the Oxford edition. Then they amended a few things or they uploaded another edition of it. And then finally someone went, okay, this is the one without any print errors. This is the one with all the correct readings this is exactly the you know the 1900 pure cambridge edition so it went through a purification process when it went hit the internet i don't think that the first edition would have been it it could have been but i, I you know I've, i'm just sort of showing you how from one technology from book form to the internet it would have gone through a process it just took a while from erasmus or complutensian polyglot to get through to the exact all the readings all in one place in the king james and so um okay so let's have a look at some of these oh i'm still going through these comments so <clears throat> elijah hickson says if they're honest now elijah always every post that i put on facebook he would always say i'm dishonest and he would finish everything with just weights and just measures now, unjust weights and unjust measures, both of them are like you're an abomination unto the Lord. And I would think, <laughs> okay, so you're basically calling me a liar. <laughs> but he just does that. He, that's just the way he is. If they're honest, if that were the case, uh, then they would have the integrity to admit that they have spoken and taught others about things that they don't know. Having assumed what the data is, was instead of checking it before teaching others 
Well, I mean, well, we're going through this, Elijah. Usually everything that's brought up about the TR, we go through it with a fine tooth comb. And so um, the variations between the TR editions are not significant is verifiably false. Well, they have a caveat there where they talk about the four editions that they're specifically talking about, okay? So if you want to bring up 22 editions, I mean, I think you're going to... Um, you're going to annoy some people as timothy has shown just from these three chapters of the whole new testament to me i think it says a lot more to see someone obeying the final edition they have in their hands by having the humility to admit when they are wrong than disputing the importance of some of these readings will we see that so it's sort of like all of a sudden, we are all tied to this one article by the Anderson brothers, I think they are, of the Trinitarian Bible Society. We're all tied to that. And we all have to admit, I'm, I'm sorry, Elijah, we've been wrong. We said that there was no no differences. I'm pointing out the differences between New King James and, and the Old King James, between Beza and Scrivener. I'm going through all these lists, <laughs> showing the minutia. I can't even be bothered going through Erasmuses and all that. They're, they're like way, way off. Because there's there's huge differences, Comiohenium differences, you know, and it's like, so the Trinitarian Bible Society, they're a TR society, okay? They make this statement. I think you guys didn't give them much wriggle room. They mentioned four. You could have stuck with those four, but you went for 22. Okay. But, you know, does that mean they're prideful? Um, it, does that mean they don't really know what's going on? Um, you know, will we see that? Do they have to come groveling? What's what's going on here? So Dwayne Green said that will all depend on the def definition of not significant. I'd be curious um, what TBS would say if asked to further expand that. And I think what they really need to do is contact TBS and not say that all TR people are TBS people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I'm sure there's articles that Trinitarian Bible Society have written I haven't even read yet, but they could probably go, hey, there's a mistake there, you know, or whatever. But I don't really even think it was a mistake. I just think it was these guys were sort of, they wanted to see that in there. I'd say the most honest assessment of their definition is not significant. Um I'd say the most honest assessment of their definition of not significant would be to look at what they call significant when it comes to the differences between the TR and modern critical editions or differences among modern critical editions. Uh, there's also the no true Scotsman fallacy um, where there are no significant differences among TRs because the editions uh, that do have significant differences aren't real TRs. Well, Robert Trulove would uh sorry robert trudel uh jeff riddle he says he goes with when he's studying he he looks at um you know, stephanus and beza as like okay they're they're protestant editions etc so he doesn't really even go to the erasmus editions although he acknowledges that that is a earlier work um so but at the end of the day uh, I don't tie myself to any anything except for the underlying text of the King James, okay? So, so he's saying it's a true, um, no true Scotsman's fallacy, okay? It's sort of like he's saying that we're not admitting there's differences between the TR. Okay, so I guess these guys are sort of pointing at Jeff Riddle, I guess, confessional bibliology guys, but they're just throwing every TR advocate in there. Um, on my website, I've got where there are differences in TR editions. I've got where there's the Comiohenium, not in the first two editions of Erasmus. Um, I talk about that at length. I've done whole videos on why Erasmus eventually did put the Comiohenium back in. And so um, let me just read this again. I'd say that the most honest assessment of their definition of not significant 
would be to, um, to look at what they call significant. Well, I'd say, um, I, I would say that even the differences between Beza and Stephanus, sorry, Beza and um, uh, Scrivener is, I, I think every, every little change is significant. And see, this is where I guess I'm always saying to people, you know, tighten up a bit, you know, but why, why are you leaving it loose? But I think people leave it loose because they haven't studied things yet. So there's certain things that I've studied and I've come to conclusions and I'm like, well, that's watertight where other people are like, I don't think it's that watertight. And so they've sort of, or they've just got a sort of cursory look at things. They're just holding it at arm's length going, okay. I mean, who has the time to study all these things? I'm studying all these things like, listening to stuff all the time um you know i've sort of given myself over to this and uh there's still so much that i don't you know i'm learning and growing in and um but at the end of the day for me as a tr person i would just say okay a whole verse deleted is a significant issue it's significant when it is changing doctrine it's significant when it's um causing you know, like they're saying, the wrong genealogy or the wrong history or the wrong, uh, it causes a contradiction or something like that. And so I think any one of those is significant. I, I don't have category one, two, three, four, four. I just have true reading or false reading. That's all I have. And so the no truth Scotsman fallacy, I can understand that um, with certain people having the, okay, well, it's under the TR banner the Protestant TR banner, so they're fine sort of thing. But between the 1550 and the, the King James, there are entire verses that are not in the 1550 of Stephanus. So to me, that's big. And I, that's why I don't have, I don't go, hey, I follow Stephanus. That's why I don't even go, hey, I follow Beza. I can go, hey, I follow Beza and his annotations as well, because that equals the underlying text of the King James. And I can hold this up and go, well, I follow a va the vast majority of this. There's a few little crumbs, a few little um, breadcrumbs that I'm not happy with, but it's round right about there because I'm a fussy guy and I want to be, I want to be very particular because I know that, you know, the Mark Wards of the world, they're going through and where people don't have their shoelaces tied up, he's tripping them up and, um, where I believe that my position is um, is completely defensible, where I hear some other TR guys saying stuff, and I'm like, man, I could even argue against that. You know? And that's why I do what I do. I try and teach TR people, KJV people, to have better argumentation. Uh, I'm sure I upset a few people here and there, but you know, it's just the way it is. MMR, I'm sure... This is the guy I had to block from the Texas Receptors Academy, but that's fine. Um, Matthew, I think his name is. The major variance, great significance category, is a bit overdone. Although the picture painted by some read many, TR defenders can certainly be misleading. This take uh, isn't all that much better. In my uh, opinion, I think the truth probably lies somewhere between the two opposing views. If both sides could only ditch the partisanship, a more healthy middle ground may present itself on this point. Um, yeah, it's pretty hard to work with someone who says you're in a cult. <laughs> it's like uh, you guys, uh, you know, critical text people oftentimes, are, oh, King James only cult, you're a Ruckmanite, you know, and you, you'll see that in these comments. You know. uh, so Domain says you're absolutely correct. The TR is an extremely good text with some scribal errors in it. We need to use everything that God has given us to improve it and to bring it um, even closer to the original. So I wrote, I actually wrote, um, this was to Elijah Hickson. Yeah, we're all just dishonest. I roll. Uh, my side, Texas Receptus, not bananas and apples. You know, it's it's called Texas Receptus. Like, why won't they say, or oh, the Texas Receptus site says this or that? They don't even go there. Has much of this info at disputed points? Um, it would seem you guys simply choose which TR people you will listen to and ignore those who deal with these issues. And so this is the thing. 
when it comes to the crunch, they're doing the textual confidence collective. It's like, why don't we believe the TR? And, and Mary's Robinson's there. They're like Revelation 16.5. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm the Revelation 16.5 guy. Why not talk to me? Why not debate me? It's because I've got good argumentation and they don't, don't want to go there. Oh, Kami Ohanian. Okay. I'm the Kami Ohanian guy. I'm the one who talked to Georgios Babiniotis. I'm the one doing articles about Erasmus and uh, all these other people. And so um, they don't want to talk to me about that because they, I think they know that they would lose the argument because I have some very good things to say about all those issues. And so um, that's why I'm saying there, what, why, are they, why are they only fishing up a, like a 1990s article when we're talking about, yeah, oftentimes these are like stuff that we read when we were new Christians. But, oh, wow, that's interesting. And, and we've moved so far away from Trinitarian Bible Society material. It's like, you know, leaps and bounds above, you know, like when you look at, say, their their Easter article or their Comiohanium article or anything like that, yeah, it's okay. But it's nothing like you would... Um, the really, really good stuff that you would get on the internet nowadays. It's it's like there's so much good stuff on the internet that uh, like even the kjvtoday.net site would blow a lot of these TBS articles out of the water. I'm not saying they're wrong, but they just, it's, some of the information is dated. And but some of it's good. Some of it you read and go, yeah, that's brilliant. That's really good. Keep that one. Others are like, mm, whatever. But um so James Snap Jr. says, superb slogging, Timothy. But I suspect that the response from most TR advocates um, elicited on arbitrary theological grounds will be to say something along the lines of the Holy Spirit took the TR through its own filtering process in the 1500s until it reached its definitive form as the base text of the KJV and go from there. Well, um, at the end of the day, I would say new technology came along. They went from manuscripts to printing. It took them a while to iron issues out, but by 1611, they'd ironed all those issues out. And, um, but what does James Knapp Jr. believe about the preservation of the word of God? Does he believe that God has preserved his word? And where is that? Now, James Knapp Jr. has done his own Greek text. Who's using that? Who's using... Um, a, a translation of that you know wh where is this in all the languages of the world <laughs> you know what i mean his special little greek text is that it is that the final definitive word or does, or isn't he an absolutist he's like no well um i mean it could be the critical text reading there or it could be here or, you know is he like that um so elijah hickson's like that sounds like ruckmanism with extra steps so anything supernatural, and these guys are deists. When it comes to the word of God, they're deists. It's like God just sort of threw the word of God out there and said, it's inspired, guys, and then just shut the door and never to be seen ever again. <laughs> you know, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall by no means pass away. These words, not doctrines, not manuscript words, don't add or take from the word or, or else you're part will be taken from the book of life and from the holy city it's talking about you should you will know if you're doing that sin because you'll have all the words and so um bob rayla says but is the final step really kjv or is the final step new king james version why or why not robinson pierpont which is certainly a better representation of the majority text in any form of the TR. Well, the TR isn't a representation of the majority text. The difference is the Texas Receptus used the Byzantine text as a base where the majority text people use it as their final product. They don't do that with the Septuagint though, do they? <laughs> the Greek uh, Old Testament text, they can compare that with the Hebrew and go, oh, it's got lots of errors in it. Where we can compare the Texas Receptus with the Latin we can compare it with uh, the early church writings. We can compare it with 
um, yeah, gr grammatical consistency, internal evidence, doctrinal evidence. We can look at outside of those closed class of witnesses and look at um, you know, the Syriac, the Arabic. We can look at a whole bunch of stuff where the majority of texts are sort of like Greek only. It's it's they're sort of like yeah the, you know, the Catholics with Latin only. The, these guys are like Greek only. But what you'll find is that the reformers they were oftentimes are making the diglots, but they were looking at everything. And so I think it's good to look at everything rather than just uh, limit yourself. Daryl Post said the Holy Spirit took the TR through its own filtering process in the 1500s until it reached its definitive form as a base text of the TR and go from there. <clears throat> and it might include the classic, God must have done this. I would add that in my, my own collation work of John 11, I did collate four TR editions to aid my identification of late manuscripts that were likely copied from a printed text. As I understood the history, Erasmus used um, Gregory Allen II and occasionally wrote corrections from Gregory Allen I. In John 11, I see some of those Gregory Allen I readings in Erasmus's uh, 1516 and 1527 editions, readings that were later replaced at least by 1550 one is the choice of the preposition in John 11.32. Another change not involving Gregory Aland, one was in 11.16, from disciples to fellow disciples. But in John 11, most of the other changes between the editions were minor spelling issues and presence, absence of the definite article. Okay. So Mark Ward says, well done, Tim. As you know, I made a similar argument in the Detroit Baptist Seminary journal that checked far fewer trs just two so he checked the um the text of scrivener with the 1550 instead of checking that with Beza, it's like um that would bring him much closer um you know ish that would that would make the amount of variance you know, much, much smaller because as you go further away from Beza's text, you get further variance. And so because it was um, not 100% 100% settled, but now we're like, we've got the settled text, we've got all the words. And so, um, so how long can both Calvinistic and IFB TR defenders claim to have a preserved, pure, stable, settled, unchanging, in their words, and repeatedly Greek New Testament text that has been given to them by supernatural means while also at least occasionally acknowledging that their textual tradition contains variants. I mean, it's just, this is a biggest straw man argument. This is the, it's, it makes me cringe. It's like, you know, if I said, Hey, this phone is the best phone, this iPhone, the latest iPhone is the best phone. Mark Ward's like, well, let's compare it with the iPhone three. So uh, I'm not saying the iPhone 3 is the best. Yeah, it might have um, been an earlier edition of it, but it's you know, what we have now is th that's the best. That's what I'm saying is the best. He's like, no, if you, you have to acknowledge that there's differences. It's like, well, of course I acknowledge there's differences. Who's not acknowledging that there's differences? And then it's like, yeah, th 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 it's, just, it's like arguing with kids. It, it, it really drives me crazy. And you can probably tell as soon as Mark Ward's argumentation comes up, I get so frustrated because it's such a, it's such a lie. <laughs> what he's saying is so silly. It's so, it, it just doesn't relate to Texas receptors, King James people at all, you know? So anyway, <clears throat> um, the unchanging, all their words, used repeatedly, a Greek New Testament that has been given to them by supernatural means, while also, or at least occasionally, acknowledging that their textual tradition contains variants. Um, why is it okay for them to have variants, but minor satanic? Again, their word. <laughs> Notice he's gotten one word from the book, um, you know, Why I Chose the Received Text, which had 30 different authors. One guy said, um, that if you change the word of God, it's satanic. Mark Ward's taken this upon himself and playing the victim like they're, they're saying, oh, what I'm doing is satanic. Um, when Pierre Pont, majority text guy, he did a whole article saying that critical text people basically 
uh, are doing the work of Satan. <laughs> it's a four-page article. I think he mentioned Satan probably about 20 times in it. And it's like, well, why isn't he talking about him? You know, just, just TR, one TR guy said it. But I, I'm going to put myself out there and say, I think it is satanic to change the word of God. I, I think what Mark Ward is doing, Mark Ward works for Faith Life. Faith Life own Logos and Verbum, the Catholic branch of Logos. They make money by selling, you know, books and, and teachings on the rosary about popes, about all sorts of Catholic uh, heresy. And Mark Ward works for Faith Life. He's a compromiser. He won't make a stand and say, hey, I'm no longer going to work for this company since um, I found out that they, you know, sell Catholic material. I don't want money from a group that um, promotes this sort of rubbish. I'm going to quit and go out there and work for some other Protestant group or some other. But no, he's you know, happy working for the Faith Life Logos Verbum um, Consortium. He, he loves it. So um, I think that what he's doing is deeply compromised. And I think it's a conflict of interest. You know, the Roman Catholics have been against the Protestant text, the paper pope. For how long? And, you know, who's funding you know, Logos, Faith Life, Verbum? I'm sure they get a lot of money from their you know, Catholic sponsors, from you know, people, their customers who are Catholics. Why, why isn't he coming against them? Why is he coming against people who believe we have a Bible? We have a finalized Bible. He's selling, like, even if he's just selling Logos, okay, Logo, isn't that a conflict of interest? That financial gain for all these different Bibles out there. And he's like, you know, King James, well, you, you know, should get rid of it and get, get the new ones. You'll get the better understanding. And it's like, um, it's disingenuous. Then he's like, the Ruckmanites have seen through this inconsistency. They have chosen to make the KJV itself the locus of God's preservation. Perhaps that's where many TR defenders will end up. So, you know, he already calls everyone a Ruckmanite. If you believe you know where all the words of God are. See, that means I'm a Ruckmanite as well, which is so strange. Okay, see him done. Mr. Ward, you make a great point. I read the locus of God's preservation. There are many advocates of the King James Bible that are neither Ruckmanites nor TR men. The question is for a Bible given in any tongue, um, is it self-supporting? Does it have um, structural integrity? Um, does it contradict itself at any point? If so, it is not truly inerrant, a concept with which I assume you may disagree, uh, nor is it correct. A great example is Hebrews 3.16, wherein the KJV is correct and the New King James is incorrect. So if you don't know about that verse um, in or it might actually have this very similar reading as the New King James here. For who were those who heard and rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? So it's basically saying no one entered into the promised land. Where if you read the King James, it says some entered in. Okay. Uh, so in the King James, it says some entered in. New King James, it says no one entered in. Same Greek New Testament, different results, quite possibly due to Farsed Hodges' um, uh, predilection. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting very tired. It's almost four o'clock in the morning here. <clears throat> For their own manufactured Greek New Testament, that they didn't use it in the New King James, nor for the later uh, Holman Christian Standard Version. Hodges and Farsed as Scrivener had no business dealing in Bible issues as they never regarded it as truth. Um, FH um, used for the name majority text or um, Farstead Hodges, I guess, as well as KJV and applied the new the word new to it and thus muddying the waters for serious students of a TR, majority text, King James Bible, etc. The conclusion is, as you say, that the final destination becomes a finished product whether Greek, uh, Chinese, or English, uh, this is the work of textual criticism and need not be restricted to the language of the original, so to speak. Thank you for your insight on this as far as uh, the content of the article being commented on. I recommend Mr. Hickson for 
I commend Mr Higgins for his scholarship and willingness to look at the TR issue. Okay, so that was a bit of everything in that last comment. But um, so anyway, I didn't touch on the video yet. So what I'll do, I'll make a promise that will go to that video. But what I might do is I might go through some of these comments. We have stacks. Okay. So Humon versus Hemon. Ow. Okay. Humon, your or Hemon. Ow. Okay. Very good. Um, probably a print error, <clears throat> which was numer numerous in the old printings. Yes. Um, it is a typo. Yes, a typo which was not corrected by Beza. I wonder if it's in Beza's 1604 printing. So that would be pretty easy to check. So um, I might actually just do that right here, right now, because that would solve a lot of issues. So maybe I'll go to my website, tr.org.au. Okay. Oops. Um, <clears throat> okay, 1604 Beza. Looks like it goes to Google Books. Hopefully we can see it. Yeah, read free of charge. Okay. So go down to Matthew. Matthew 4, 5, 6, 9. Let's zoom in a bit. It still has that um, print error. And so this is why I'm... Um, Look, it's got the same word here, the same word there. Um, but that's the same word translated because I know it's, uh, you know, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, you will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, the Arton, uh, a daily bread. It's got our, forgive us our debts. And so it's interesting. He has pointed out this issue. And so it would say, when you pray, you know. So we'll look at this. We'll study this more. I'll go through all the editions of the TR on it. We'll check with the Latin. Um, and we'll go through that. We'll look at the annotations and we'll, we'll check everything out. So... Let's get back to um, I'll just put that up to remind us that we are going to go start going through this in our next video. Now, I didn't mean to deceive anyone. I was expecting just to go through that article in like 15 minutes and just sort of throw it over to here but there was quite detailed and i had to check on a lot of things and so uh it was corrected later um i think the confusion of humon with Hemon and vice versa was one of the most common typos in the old editions Dwayne green says helg it's uh it's also a very common variant in the manuscript edition um this isn't to say that these are not print errors but i do think it's an assumption to say so Oftentimes, Mesker in his commentary will say something like the scribes um, made it this reading to match uh, the LXX. Um, this is more assumption than anything, and I think print error is also an assumption. Um, what makes you think that it's a print error rather than someone's analysis making a decision? I, the reason why I would default to a print error thing is because I've never heard of it. Okay, This is the first time it's been brought up. 
there are things that I can read in Beza. And I'm like, why, why hasn't anyone brought this up? And then I study it and go, ah, oh, because it's a nothing. <laughs> it's a print error, you know. Um, and so that there are things that most people, when they look at it, they go, ah, oh, it's a print error, you know. So say the issue that um, was brought up by Brian Ross, the, the Jude chapter 1, verse 25 issue. Now, I made videos on it. He made some responses to it. Um, but at the end of the day, like to me, it, it was clearly based upon a print error that was amended and fixed where he was saying, no, that error um, was put in there by later people and mistakenly and that um, shouldn't be in there and, and all the, all this other stuff. And I was like, no, no, it should be in there. It's in the, it's in the text. It's just It's just a print error where people went through and they double checked things with the bishop's bible it was a print error in the bishop's bible and sometimes that can follow through because things were based upon bishops as well so um so yeah th there are places where i've gone okay my hunch is that it's a print error and gone to the mat on this and gone and come out going it's a print error you know the two are easy to confuse both in handwriting and in printing um, Helg Evanson, yes. It's a single letter. And you take the um, epistolatory um, we, and you can see how we could be in someone's mind based on the context. Um, be Catholic or be lost says uh tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that worketh evil a glory and honor and peace to everyone that worketh good through faith in his blood a hannah says uh, when you list all the variants as part of the text you're essentially admitting that you have no idea what the word of god is um it adds nothing except job security to text critics um sw makers and youtubers etc most people know there are variants in pre-tr editions but the reason it is the received text is because it was received yeah yeah well that's a good point is people were receiving it as it came now if you yeah if you had um if you served up you know everything on the menu you you made it all available but you didn't have you know four or five things on the, that were that should be on the menu <clears throat> um that should be available sorry but then later on they receive them as well it's like well the received text it grew in a sense and i don't understand why people see this as such a strange concept i mean i've talked about the technology change but um with English Bibles, it's exactly how someone would describe English Bibles from Tyndale. You wouldn't expect that we would go to Tyndale and go, yes, that's exactly how I want to read it for forever. Um, or uh, the bishops or Geneva. We would see these as precursors to something that came later that was greater. So we would see that Beza's text is, you know, in, in the Greek, it is, you know, a... a a definitive moment but the king james translators did their own greek text and that's the one that we follow so Dwayne said uh be catholic or be lost i don't know your pope is really causing a stir these days yeah <laughs> who'd want to follow the roman catholic church i mean pretty weird i do not regard francis as the pope since he's outside the church mm, okay <laughs> that's convenient uh a hannah says i thought christ uh, chose Paul in Acts 9 as his chosen vessel and Peter and, uh, and mentioned after Acts 15 hey Hannah um, to the Gentiles um, are you a Gentile Dwayne Green yes sir so we just got a bit of banter there um, okay Pope Paul the fourth in the 16th century so that no one outside the church can become the Pope, uh, even his, if his election was unanimously accepted by everyone. Without a declaration, you can avoid them. 
I'm glad that the promises are for both Jew and Gentile. Um, don't we want a final edition? So getting back to what we're saying. Uh, be Catholic or be lost, said, of course, the King James Version is one of the best, if not the best, of the Protestant versions, but it isn't but it isn't faithful. The Latin Vulgate in all details um, isn't faithful to the Latin Vulgate. Uh, I read the Chaloner revision of, I read the Chaloner revision of the Douay Reims. Okay, uh, Douay Reims is way better than the critical text, but sorry, um, no prize, no cigar for you because it is still filled with um, not as serious error, but still what I would consider errors. Um, Dwayne says, sure would. Um, but does it have to be word for word to be a final form? Uh, I didn't mention this in my discussion with Timothy, but Brian Ross, Ross's verbatim identicality of discussion could apply. Um, well, I think Brian Ross with his verbatim identicality discussion um, when I'm listening to him, he's usually talking about things that are completely synonymous, but you know, like Rabdon and Rabdos that I talked about before, staff or sta staves. If you're talking to a bunch of people, it becomes plural anyway. So it's like you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. That's sort of what he's getting at, you know. Um, now, sometimes when he's quoting, you know, um, uh, he quotes him all the time. I should know his name, but it's very late here. That's my excuse. Um, he quotes a guy who's, you know, like a, a King James sort of expert, but he's, he, I think he's secular. Um, but anyway, he he mentions, you know, certain verses that were added or certain words that were added and things like that, I should say. And I just, most of the time, I just do a basic study and it's easy to prove that, you um, yeah, these were just either typos or um, they were just mistakes in, in printing. These these were fixed up later on. Skiers Appendix C notes several print differences between Elzevir's uh, 1624 and 1633, among which some are Humon versus Hemon differences just between these two editions. Yeah, it's, um, I know Hoskia in his, um, I think it's Codex B and it's allies. It might be in that one, but he does have a lot of lists where he compares Texas Receptus editions. Um, so these guys, many times you hear Mark Ward saying, no one's ever done this. Well, I think Hoskia did um, full collations of all the TR editions. Be Catholic or be lost. Isn't it faithful to, it isn't faithful to the Latin Vulgate in all details. Yeah, well, the Latin Vulgate um, had become corrupted. And so while the Latin is good, it's much better than the critical text. Um, you should look at Latin and Greek. You should look at everything, not just limit yourself to just Latin. Um, in the same list, he notes accents and breathings, breathing differences between the two. Yeah, very interesting. Um, the Catholic will be lost, says uh, Pope Paul IV in the 16th century said no one outside the church can become a Pope. We heard that before. A. Hennis says, I align with Ross. Um, doesn't need to be verbatim identical. Also, I haven't watched your video yet at Dwayne Green. Um, Hel Geberson, you are rocking it today, sir. The Catholic Colby Lost says, also, Protestants don't know how to read the Bible. You only depart from the literal if necessi necessity demands it. Thus, we literally eat Christ. John um, uh, 6.53, since Christ has the power to do so. Well, Jesus said he was the door. It's not like he's walking around with a doorknob on his shoulder or something and, and a key lock. You know, it's... There, he oftentimes, you know, said he was bread and, you know, you, you've, you're only just taking that literally because if it's with your mass, your Eucharist, 
which I believe is a complete abomination um, by saying that you can turn you know, a priest can do a hocus pocus and turn it into um, the literal blood of Jesus, literal body of Jesus. To me, that's blasphemy. Um, and these priests aren't magicians. And the thing is, even if these priests you know, become apostate, they can still do it. <laughs> because I know, because my uncle was a priest, he was a Jesuit, and he left. And But he could still go hocus pocus and turn it into the bread and wine if he really wanted to. Amazing. Strange, bizarre, Gnostic type of teachings. Solus Christus, Hickson himself, if Hickson himself were honest, um, if would admitted... Uh, he never actually collated manuscript 61 back when he surveyed 1 John 5, 7. Okay, I'm not really sure about that argument, but uh, it's an interesting claim. A. Hannah says, exactly, uh, revolution, guilt by association again. So I guess we're sort of catching up to some of the places in the video. Um, Helg says, in the appendices of his full account and collation um, codex EV604 uh, in 1890. Okay, interesting. Uh, A. Hannah says, Elijah always says, no true Scotsman fallacy, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's the thing with Elijah. He's always like, you're lying. You're dishonest. When are you going to say it? When are you going to admit that you're a liar? You know, basically that's every every post he says. It's just like, um, I just roll my eyes and go, okay, we're, we're, we're just deliberately going out of our way to be dishonest. If I'm being dishonest here, I, I want people to rebuke me. Please, I'm begging you to rebuke me. Show me where I'm wrong. Show me what I'm doing is unbiblical. That would be really good. Because I don't really know what I'm supposed to repent of. Because Mark Ward just wants me to repent of Ruckmanism. Or he wants me to repent of believing that we have all the words of God. I don't know how to do that because um, I think we have all the words of God. And I think the Bible teaches that. Um, anyway, be Catholic or be lost, okay, that he might sanctify it, cleansing it um, by the labor of the water in the word of life, no necessity to be symbolic, and thus it's literal water for the sacrament of baptism. Uh, no, the water of the word, uh, yes, it can wash us, but... Um, you know, there are many symbolisms in the Bible, and so you only sort of read them as literal when they line up with the Catholic Church. It's very convenient. It's just a national church. It's just like the Romans just went, hey, we're Romans. We like our language, Latin, and if you don't speak it, we, you're in trouble. You're, you're, you're off the wall, and you have to follow the Latin texts, and you have to follow the Latin church, and that, that's... And they expanded and, and became popular. Um, it's just nationalism. I, I don't follow nationalism. Jesus said, going to the, all the world, preach the gospel to all nations. Um, what's so special about Rome? <laughs> what's so special about Romans? Um, nothing. You just you've over bloated your egos. You need to repent. You, you follow Mary. Uh, you talk and chant to dead people. Mary is not listening to you. If you're chanting to someone and she's talking back to you, you're probably talking to a familiar spirit. Mary was not um, conceived immaculately. She, her, her mother was not um, a virgin. Her, she was not conceived without sin. There was no way that she, that she escapes the whole concept of being a sinner. The Bible says all the sin comes short of the glory of God. Um, you know, she didn't ascend into heaven. Where is that in the Bible? It's ridiculous. Um, but you know, Catholics have these strange teachings, you know, wearing the brown scapula, um, you know, praying the rosary, uh, nuns, priests. Um, none of this is in the Bible. The Vatican, it's just popes. It, it's just bizarre, strange. It's not Christian whatsoever. <clears throat> Solus Christus said um, he would have also admitted dating paper based on watermarks 
is unknown to shaky at best. The proper way to date watermarks is to hold the manuscript up to light and compare it to other watermarks. Did not do so. Okay, very interesting. Seems like uh, Solus Christus seems to know a lot about Elijah Hickson and uh, his collation methodology. Be Catholic or be lost, says Pope Leo the Thirteenth. Um, probably that Latin word. Um, not to depart from the literal and obvious sense, except only where reason makes it untenable or necessity requires. Okay, so show me where in the Bible it says that Mary ascended up into heaven. Show me that, please, and I'll believe it. I'll join your church. Hell says, uh, remember to hit the like button, you all, and um, the most common it's the most common YouTube emission. Yeah, it'd be great if you guys uh, hit the like button. That'd be great. Or share it around. Um, that's pretty much all I ask um, from you guys. That'd be great. Be Catholic or be lost. Uh, the six days of creation were also literal. Uh, therefore, since there is no necessity to say otherwise, well, why did the Roman Catholics in the 1990s um, adopt the theory of evolution? It's, um, it's not biblical. Terry O'Neill says, regarding the TR editions being a process, isn't that part of being the received text? That it took time for the church's feedback to be included until the destination was reached? Yeah, I guess so. Um, but I, I guess, too, there have been texts with errors that have been received. You know what I mean? So I think just something that's called the received text, I think... I can understand that it's the received text. People have received it. People have gone, okay, I believe that text. But, um, you know, like some people have gone to the 1550 and gone, well, I think that's the text, you know, and they've followed that one. And so I think sometimes just these labels, we can read into these labels a whole bunch of things. And um, I sort of summarize everything just on my website here. Um, Texas Receptus. So I just have Texas Receptus Latin received text is the name retroactively given to the secession of printed Greek language texts of the New Testament, which constituted the textual base for the original German Luther Bible for the translation of the New Testament into English by William Tyndale, um, Miles Coverdale, Matthew Bible, Great Bible, Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible, and the King James Version. And for most other Reformation era New Testament translations throughout Western and Central Europe, such as the Spanish Reina Valera translation and the Czech Bible of um, Koralake, the Texas Receptus has been translated to hundreds of languages. Uh, the origin of the term Texas Receptus comes from the publisher's preface to the 1633 edition produced by um, Abraham Elzevit and his nephew Bonaventure, who are printers at Leiden. And it talks about, um, so you hold the text now received by all in which nothing is corrupt. And so I think the thing is, while there are differences in what would be labeled TR, um, I think most people are pointing specifically to an edition. And go, that's the TR. And so <clears throat> that's why I just point to the King James and say, well, this is the final TR, but it's in English. Yeah, I wish they did a Greek parallel Bible back then, but they didn't. Um, Scrivener attempted to do that 250 years later, came out with this, um, did a pretty good job at it. But <clears throat> um, the two words text and, and receptum were modified from the accusative to the nominative case to render Texas receptus. Over time, this term has been retroactively applied to Erasmus's editions as his work served as the basis for others that followed. Many supporters of the Texas Receptus will name any manuscript which agrees with the Texas Receptus Greek as a Texas Receptus type manuscript. This type of association can also apply to the early church quotations and language versions. Even when we're talking about the Hebrew, we say that we can say the Hebrew Texas Receptus. So it's sort of the name can mean many different things. It can mean one edition. It can mean a whole bunch of editions. It can mean manuscripts that back up those editions. It can mean the Old Testament. It's and so 
there's lots and lots of meanings behind Texas Receptus. So, but I'm really enjoying your um, your banter, uh, Terry O'Neill. You're, you're saying some very interesting things and asking some very interesting questions. <clears throat> I might have a sip of water. <clears throat> I get like this when I'm street preaching in Papua New Guinea. I just keep talking and talking and talking until I'm like, actually, it's getting dark. <laughs> we should go home. Well, it's four o'clock in the morning here, so I should finish this very soon. Um, <clears throat> Helg says, is revolution paying you to say that? <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't get it. I, I'm usually losing money by running web servers and, and spending all my spare time doing all this textual stuff, you know, I mean, the amount of money that I fork out every month is through the roof, but it's a hobby that I love. Some people love golf. Some people love you know, doing up old cars. I, I just, I love the word of God and I love defending it. Um, be Catholic or be lost. He has another one saying this Pope here says, God on the sixth day of creation, having made man from the slime of the earth and having breathed into his face, the breath of life gave him a companion. Well, you know, A. Hannah says, um, great TC Diaz description. It is like a, a cult. Yeah, it seems that they don't have a supernatural God. And James Snap Jr. mocks that, that they mock the preservation of God. Um, uh, be Catholic or be lost, says uh, 2 John 1 9, whosoever revolteth and, um, See, notice revolteth, I mean a revolution here. And continueth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that continueth in the doctrine hath both the Father and the Son. Okay. Uh, a. Hannes says, uh, yes, I received $10 a month. I need the money. I can't remember what that was for, but uh, A. Hannes says, ward again hits his zenith of narcissism again great job tim me 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 <laughs> yeah uh, I've, I've noticed that he is just the, playing the victim he's like these people say that i'm i love satan these people say that i'm this and i'm that and it's like all, all we do is point out hey mark you calling us all ruckmanites you did a whole video apologizing to say that we're all king james onlyists but now you call us Ruckmanites and King James only is and say, we say it's all Satan and all this stuff. And it's like, you, many people aren't saying that, but I did. So you, why not just, you know, say Nick Sayers said this and this other guy said that you half the time. We don't We can't tell if you're talking about all TR people or all King James only people, or just everyone who's even sniffed a King James cover or just one guy on your YouTube feed, you know, because sometimes it's like, well, someone contacted me just yesterday and said, you believe in a flat earth. It's like, who? Be be more specific, you know. You're just throwing, you're just entering into vague generalities. Anyway, notice every time Mark Ward gets brought up, I just, <laughs> I start getting frustrated. If Decker examined 22 Texas receptors editions and the best he can come up with is our father and arms charity versus righteousness. We've got nothing to worry about. <laughs> yeah. And really the whole issue of uh, charity and uh, um, arms charity versus righteousness. Abiza has the reading of the King James. Scrivener changed it. I don't think he changed it for any good reason. He admits in his original 1881 preface that he changed it. It's like, why did you do that? And he just basically follows what's gotten hot there. And he doesn't say it's a change in his appendix at the end, he's in his 190 list. Um, Solus Christus says, like Decker was trying to turn the mainstream TR position into a general TR position, that's more similar to the critical text position uh, and then refute the general position. Yeah, because some people like TR, one edition, you know, TR, underlying this is the, my TR, or, you know, 
Scuba, that's my tier. Or, you know, Visa, yeah, that's my tier, you know. Um, but then it's like, oh, all these other things are labeled TR2, so you have to support them. And if you don't acknowledge this variance and be honest and start groveling and asking for forgiveness and, you know, we're going to do an altar call in a minute and you have to put your hand up and repent of not acknowledging variance between Erasmus and and uh, and Colonnais, you know, it's like, get a, get a grip, guys. You know, talk, why not talk about what we're talking about? Um, you know, in, in going to the Trinitarian Bible Society, I mean, like I said, these guys are, a lot of these articles are rolled articles. And um, maybe they could have worded it better. But it's like, I, I don't think it's being, um, it's it's representative of their position. They're pretty clear about what they believe. And so, um, are you going to continue this in a few hours after you have some sleep, Nick? No. Um, one of the reasons why I'm doing this now is because I actually have a midday appointment that I have to be at. And so... Um, I'm going to be very busy, so I thought I'd do it all now. That way, um, it's out of the way, and probably maybe tomorrow night I might be able to do another one, but it will be early for you guys. It'll probably be be like about you know four or five in the morning for you guys, so you guys will probably have to watch it later on. Um, Dwayne Green said, "I think a nonsensical typo could be linked to a print error, but when a typo is not nonsensical." It will be difficult to determine with that documentation. And, yeah, well, there is a lot of documentation. Like like I mentioned with the text of uh, Visa. So let me just get Visa back up here. <clears throat> so, like, he, this is his 1598. So it's like, say here, he has um, the Greek here. But then all we have to do is look at his Latin translation. And if it is verbatim and it has our father... So it's pater noster quies in chaos, which is uh, heaven. And so um, pater noster, maybe I can just type that in now. Let's go to translate. Pater noster means our father. Um, so this... Visa has like a like a built-in way to check to double check his words, and this is what I'm saying. Sometimes you read through and it won't have God in the text, but it's in the Latin. But then you'll see he's commenting down the bottom on God, and it's like, oh, he just didn't put it in. Whoops, it's a typo. So here you can clearly see the Paternoster means our Father in the Latin. So it's it's pretty clear, and so that's where you would go, well, I'm pretty sure that's just a typo. And, I mean, look at it. <laughs> Imagine, like, going through being a print guy. And the thing is, too, the next print guy would probably just copy the previous edition. And how many of these guys, uh, these printers, could read Greek fluently? Oftentimes, they're just copying the exact form. And so this could go through several editions. Um, and really, unless he mentions there's a change also, because he wouldn't have changed something. Um, and so in the article, it says um, that this uh, this one of Visa was <clears> the <throat> 1582. So, um, I mean... Let's quickly go to the an earlier one. Um, Fifteen sixty-five visa. Let's go there. Uh, page view. And we'll see if we can. Okay, so that's a bit too far. Okay, so chapter four, chapter five, a few more clicks and we should be there.
<clears throat> okay, lots of notes. Chapter five, still. Okay, chapter six. It should be this page here. Here we go. The Paternoster there. And look, it's got the, the reading. And um, we know that this reading here is the U. This is our. And we know that it appears um, down here, here. So it's the same there, it's the same there, and it's different there. So this is correct. Um, I think it's just because it's got a ligature there. It confused some people. He's pretty much got the same footnote there. So I, he never mentions that there's a change from you know, 1598. Usually he would say, oh, I changed it um, and tell you the reasons. So that's an, uh, even just him not talking about it is proof. And just the fact that the Latin has paternoster. Now, it has the double lines here. So that could also mean that there is something else said about it somewhere. Um, because I, I usually, I don't see the double lines much. But maybe it's an indication that it's related to, you know, Luke, um, Luke 11. There, maybe that's it. Or... He would describe that in the in the preface, what that means. But anyway, I'm sort of rabbit trailing. We've got a few more comments to go. Uh, Ashati says, grace and peace. Uh, Ashati says, at one time, Roman Catholicism became popular by bloodshed in force. Yes, that's how South America was converted through the sword. Uh, Dwayne Green says, ah, Mr. Latin part. Yeah, so that's why um, Beza is very good and handy because um so yeah when you look at say the, like the scrivener text basically it's um the amon here pata amon hoen tois uranos so um, anyway, I think I'm going to leave it there. Um, bless you guys. Thanks for watching. And we will see you hopefully tomorrow. Um, but most of you will probably be watching later on. But hopefully you've enjoyed this. And um, I'll continue on with that video. And we'll look at some of the comments that have come up on that video as well. And thanks for joining us, guys. God bless you. And we'll see you again another time.